All right, everyone, welcome to our Iowa State University and NRCS organic training. I'm Kathleen Dellett, organic specialist and professor in the departments of agronomy and horticulture at Iowa State University, and I welcome you to Iowa State. Um, I'd like to start with acknowledgments, starting with um, Jay Harmon, our ISU Extension Outreach Ag and Natural Resource Director. He'll be up here in a minute for his support of this training. And then to Kevin Kuhn and everyone at NRCS for their assistance with this training and helping to get more support for transitioning and certified organic farmers. We also thank Lindsay Haynes, who's the national organic leader for NRCS in DC, and for all her, her and her team's efforts in developing the organic initiative. This training is funded by USDA National Organic Program, TOP, Transitioning to Organic Partnership Program, coordinated by MOSA, Midwest Organic Services Association, out of Oroca, Wisconsin. So we appreciate their support too. You can learn more about TOP, the Organic Initiative, and browse other sources of information at the tables in the back of the room from the Iowa Organic Ag Program, our program, the Iowa Organic Association, and Practical Farmers of Iowa. We value their partnerships. At this stage, I'd like to call Dr. Jay Harmon, Director of Ag and Natural Resources in ISU Extension Outreach to the podium to give a welcome from ISU. Thank you, Jay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a beautiful morning. I know you probably would prefer to be out pulling weeds with our volunteers here in the garden, right? So, no, I, I'm glad you're here. I welcome you, and uh, we hope that you uh, enjoy your day here. Um, we really appreciate the fact that you're choosing to engage in this training um, to learn more about organic farmers uh, farming and the cost share uh, programs that NRCS has. Um, Iowa is a leader in organic. It's the sixth highest state in organic number of organic farms. And for the state, it generates 2.4 million. Um, <clears throat> so we, you know, it's a really a growing area and really important part of our state. So we, we greatly appreciate that. We also value our partnership with NRCS and USDA. Um, that's, a, that's a big deal and we appreciate that as well. And I'd like to thank the speakers that are here today and the vendors that are participating and supporting the program as well. So this, this will be a really great program. The <clears throat> ISU Organic Ag Program is 25 years old now. Kathleen started when she was 10, I think, right? So, yeah, <laughs> doesn't hurt to get a few brownie points, right? So, um, but she's really, she and her team have really built a strong program that, that we feel like really services the organic community very well and, and works and strives to help answer questions and make things possible. Um, it's a really science-based uh, information um, program that's that's helped with the principles and practices. Um, the ISU and USDA speakers today include uh, Dr. Antonio Malarino um, and Dr. Sabrina Roos, and they're, they're both going to talk about the latest science behind nutrient plans and why that's so important in the sustainable sta sustainability of agriculture. Um, ISU is a respected source of uh, information for the 800 um, certified organic farmers in Iowa and those who are interested in transitioning. And so many times I think that's the big stumbling block. How do I get started? It's always a little hard to figure that out. Um, other programs that they have that are very successful that if you haven't been involved in, I would urge you to be. Um, the organic transitioning course and then the Iowa Organic Conference is very well attended and it's a, it's a, you know, you have to go to that evil place in Iowa City, but, but it's a very good uh, conference I've been in and it's a great information and great fellowship that happens there. So we're grateful for USDA also for the program called Transition to Organic uh, Partnership Program, which uh, Kathleen mentioned a minute ago, TOP. 
which is investing um, $100 million over five years in cooperative agreements and nonprofit organizations that will partner with um, organizations like ISU, Organic Ag Program, to provide technical assistance and support for transitioning and existing organic farmers. So I would urge you to stay tuned for field days and other programs that are available in this area. Um, the, the team here really offers a lot of things, and I hope that you become connected well with them if you're not already. So the bottom line really is, if you're interested in transitioning to organic, we have a lot of help here that we can offer. So I hope you enjoy the training today. Again, thank you for being here. Uh, we really enjoy this interaction, and I know you're in good hands with uh, Dr. Dellett and, and her team and the great speakers you have. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jay. We really appreciate your support. Um, Kevin, could you provide a welcome from NRCS, please? Well, I imagine you want me to stay in front of the mic. Yes, please. Um, well, a lot of familiar faces here. I'm Kevin Kuhn, resource conservationist on our ecological science staff uh, of NRCS in Des Moines. And uh, it's nice to see that we got a lot of conservation planners here that work for the agency, a lot of producers. Um, one of the things I get involved with is some of the things with the organic uh, uh, production. Um, I will not call myself an organic specialist. And so like a lot of you folks, um, I'm learning and I'm glad to be here today to pick up uh, more of my skills as, as we're working with organic producers. So um, glad to see a great attendance and, and welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Again, really happy to have all this support and participation from NRCS here today. Um, hopefully by the end of the day, we'll get to know everybody in the room too. I just wanna blow up the schedule a little bit here um, to show you what's in, on the docket. Um, we'll start with an overview of organic practices as seen in our ISU organic research, followed by Kevin Kuhn presenting on NRCS programs of relevance to organic producers. Then Dr. Antonio Malarino presenting on nutrient management, followed by Kevin Kuhn providing an overview of the organic management practice standard and calculations that you can use in your NRCS applications. Following lunch, which we have um, catered here, Dr. Sabrina Roos of USDA ARS will present on how it's not just NP and K, but how carbon drives the organic systems. And then we'll move to the experienced organic farmer presentations and discussion on NRCS programs. Um, we'll also ask Ben Lehman in the room here and Clint Miller, who have successfully worked together in filling out an A23 organic management practice standard application. So um, I've asked them to be resources when we get to the discussion period, because we want you to leave feeling you understand the process. There are a lot of details involved and um, and hopefully, we'll, both sides will learn that NRCS will learn more about organic systems from us, and we'll learn more about what they need to fill out the application and hopefully participate in these programs. Um, there's, there's an evaluation in your packets. Hopefully, everybody got a packet. If you didn't, they're out on the table, and Bob can distribute them. If you didn't get a packet, please fill out your application. We appreciate your feedback. And then, um, those of you on Zoom, um, please put your questions into the chat box, and we're going to hold your questions till the discussion period, at which time Josiah will read your questions, and we'll take as many questions as we can, rotating between in-person questions and online questions, and any that are unanswered, we will answer them through email following the training. So thank you for your patience. We have a lot to cover today, but um, we want to make sure everybody feels like they did get enough to hopefully work on these programs together. So we'll get started with my presentation, if I can pull it up here. There we go. So just to start with a snapshot, Jay provided some details like this, that um, in 92, these, is, these statistics are from USDA NAS, National Ag Statistics Service. Um, so the last census was taken in 2021, so I think these numbers have gone up. but. Um, just to look at the, how much it's grown. In 92, there were less than a million acres of organic in the United States. 
In their last census in 21, there was 5 million acres. That's um, including 17,445 certified organic farmers. In 97, there was less than 50,000 acres of organic vegetables. And 2021, close to 238,000 acres. The industry itself, the total organic industry in the United States is $67.6 .6 billion. That's the largest in the world. Um, and that number is from Organic Trade Association for 2022. As Jay mentioned, we have the sixth largest number of organic farms coming in at 779, 169,361 acres. And in the slide on the, the graph on the right, you can see the growth in organic over the years. This is from OTA. And particularly during the pandemic, 2020, where organic sales grew 12.4%. So um, as Jay mentioned, organic continues to grow. We're excited that you're all here listening. There's been a lot of literature about the environmental benefits of organic, including these um, concerns that have been resolved somewhat through organic. Um, organic's been found, found to show that there, it would lead to lower pesticide and nitrogen in groundwater and waterways. There is more biodiversity on organic farms because it's in the regulations. And we'll talk about that in a minute, about crop rotations are required beyond corn and soybeans. You must have at least a third crop in your rotation to be certified organic. Um, we've seen literature showing higher soil microbial populations. Sabrina will be presenting a little bit about that. And higher beneficial insects because no pesticides, no synthetic pesticides are allowed on organic farms. So that would, you would think, would normally lead to having higher population of beneficial insects. But also um, showing, I know USDA has some data showing less nitrate um, in the waters, groundwater, and that also helps with um, less exposure of nitrate and pesticide to humans and wildlife. We have many organic research projects going on in our program. I'm only going to be able to focus on two of those today because of time limitations. But if you're interested in any of these research topics, they're all on our website, but also I can talk to you individually about them if you're interested. Um, the one I'm going to focus on is our LTAR, our 25-year experiment, long-term agroecological research site, where we're comparing the conventional corn soybean rotation with three organic rotations. And those organic rotations contain organic corn, soybean, oats, rye, and alfalfa. And um, then we also have done research on bean leaf beetle management, on soybean rust management. We have um, ongoing corn variety trials, but we're also do we've done soybean variety trials, and this year we did wheat variety trials too. Worked with organic sweet corn, organic grapes, organic vegetables. There are other certified organic sites. Both our sites are certified organic. Um, Crawfordsville Southeast Research Station. We, we're looking at different organic rotations there that um, we were, we've grown flax, barley, and wheat, in addition to corn and soybean. Um, we've also done grape and apple on-farm trials, or some of the apples from those trials there. And um, last, we've done organic herb research with, for a National Institute of Health project. So Jay mentioned about us working with the National Organic Program. Last year, we were um, a partner on their encouraging, I call it Encouraging More Inspectors project. So if you're interested in becoming an organic inspector, that is a really fruitful career. Um, this is this video, there was a national video they shot at our Neely Kenyon farm. That's us undergoing our organic inspection with our organic inspector. And um, that turned into a national video called Become an Organic Inspector. If you're, you can Google that, it's on the NOP website. And then also, Jay mentioned about the TOP program. So in that TOP program, we have a mentorship program. Some of you we've already hit up to be mentors. But if you're interested, if you're an experienced organic farmer and you want to get paid, to mentor a transitioning farmer, we encourage you to sign up at our booth. I think IOA, you can sign up there too. Um, and as Jay mentioned, that top also includes technical assistance for transitioning organic farmers, such as this training today. And it's not just transitioning farmers, it's also certified organic farmers can gain from these trainings too. And Jay mentioned our transitioning to organic class. Um, it's 16 weeks with 10 modules, and um, in 2024, it's going to be online solely um, through videos, but then in 2025, it will be live. It'll be both in-person and online um, 
because we run it as an Iowa State course in addition to an extension class. We've had uh, many organic farmer speakers, some of whom you'll hear from today, along with NRCS. We've had great um, cooperation interaction with NRCS in this program, having um, Dave Brommel speak for years and then Rubiana Neely. Um, great speakers, really appreciate NRCS participating, along with university speakers too. And the thing we love is that it does promote interest among future organic farmers um, because we have students at Iowa State taking the class. We have a lot of publications and a website. Our table in the back here, you'll find some publications, including the organic no-till, or is that in everybody's packet already, um, to look at that one. And then um, our website has an events section on it, so you can see all our upcoming events, including our organic conference that Jay mentioned. And save the date on that. That starts Sunday, November 26th, with a reception. Um, and vendor set up, and then the main day is Monday, November 27th. And it's, yes, it is at University of Iowa because that's where the majority of organic farmers are in the state. Um, so we have it on the east side of Iowa. And we'll have 15 breakout sessions, including or going doing a deep dive on organic certification, and then several on soil health with NRCS participating in that and other speakers, and then a lot on marketing too. And we're really happy that we have Jenny Tucker, who is the Deputy Administrator of the National Organic Program in Washington, D.C. She'll be our keynote speaker. And our theme, which relates to this training today, is organic farming, healthy soils, clean water, seeking integrity in every practice. Because that's what the NOP is about. That's what Jenny's going to be addressing, is um, keeping the standards really rigorous so that we can meet these goals. Okay, so moving on to how do you become certified organic. Can I just see a show of hands? Is anybody in the room interested in transitioning to organic? Yay, great, excellent, welcome. So this is for you. <laughs> um, the beauty of the NRCS programs is that if you, as you do, as you create your organic system plan to become certified organic, you will also be complying with a lot of the NRCS standards that go into getting some cost share for you. So we say, first thing, find your certifier. And we go through the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship because we're a public entity, they're a public entity. But there's also MOSA and OCIA that um, operate here in Iowa. You can, on our webpage is a list of all the certifying agents you can choose from. So that's the first step. And then also visit your local NRCS office, and there's the website for that. But there's a lot of NRCS folks here. I just want to ask this right up front, Kevin. Can, do they have to go to their county office, or can they, like us, you could go into any county extension office and get help, but do you, for NRCS, do you have to go to your specific county office? No, I think you go into any office. All right, so if you find somebody here that seems willing to work with you and you want to go into their office, Kevin's saying that's okay, that's great to hear. Um, and so these, both what you'll hear today from NRCS, the A23, and the organic certification rules, they're considered living documents. That means that they will, t they are reviewed periodically. So the National Organic Standards Board, who develops the rules, they meet twice a year, and they take public input. And NRCS is also taking public input on their interim standard, the organic management practice standard. So. This is the time to talk about and provide feedback and input because everybody wants these, both these systems to work well. So that's why it's considered living doc. They're both considered living documents. And then there are local agencies that can help with rule understanding. Um, we have a lot of programs. IDOLS offers programs, Iowa Organic Association. So if you have, need any help figuring out what it takes to be certified organic, please contact one of us. We are very happy to help you get certified. And I mentioned that about how there will be an overlap between what I'm saying to, to in my presentation and what you'll hear from Kevin following me. So uh, there, there's a lot of rules, and I know it can be really boring to go through them. I'm only going to present one rule just to show, give you an idea, a taste, if you haven't read any organic rules. And that relates to this uh, training today, section 205.203 the NOP rule on soil fertility and crop nutrient management. So when you become certified organic, you have to implement tillage and cultivation practices 
that maintain or improve the physical, chemical, and biological condition of soil and minimize soil erosion. You have to manage crop nutrients and soil fertility through crop rotations, cover crops, and the application of plant and animal materials. You have to manage plant and animal materials to maintain or improve soil organic matter content in a manner that does not contribute to contamination of crop soil or water by plant nutrients, pathogenic organisms, heavy metals, or residues of prohibited substances. And then animal and plant materials include raw manure, raw animal manure, which must be composted unless it is applied to land for a crop that not intended for human consumption. We don't generally follow that rule unless you're growing ornamentals because all the crops, even corn and beans, could be used for human consumption. So we follow um, two and three. If it's a vegetable crop, the raw manure has to be incorporated at least 120 days ahead of harvest. If it's an agronomic crop, corn and beans, grains, small grains, the manure has to be incorporated at least 90 days prior to harvest. So that is a very easy rule to meet. Um, we apply when the soil warms up, March, April, it's like seven months ahead of harvest. So we can easily meet that rule in Iowa. If we don't go under the compost rule. Um, we can, if anybody's interested in more details on that, let me know. But the USDA NOP rule on compost is very strict. It's very specific. You have to monitor the temperature. You have to turn it X amount of time. So I don't know anyone that follows the compost rule. Maybe in California they do. But here in the Midwest generally, we, even if it's composted manure, we go under the raw manure rule and put it on 90 to 120 days ahead, depending what the crop is. And then this goes without saying, the producer mu must not use any fertilizer or compost plant animal material that contains a synthetic substance, not included on the national list of synthetic substances, because there is a national list. There are some synthetic products on there. Something, just an example, um, is the synthetic pheromone that's used for um, insect management, but it, there's a, I don't know anybody that uses an organic fertilizer that has a synthetic substance in it, so I think you don't have to worry about that part of the rule. Okay, so just wanted to highlight, as I mentioned, two key ISU organic research projects, and um, I was really happy to see this. I did not know this. It was a surprise to me, but when I got the 823 um, practice standard, which is in your packets, um, cited in the back, listed as one of the references, was this research site. So um, I, I could say it's very relevant to this training today. Um, the LTAR, the Long-Term Agricultural Research Site, it's now 25 years old. And just to show you some of the practices that we use there that you could think about um, would be necessary to be certified organic. So since, we, since the site, each plot is positioned on the landscape in a completely randomized design, to avoid any bias, we have to have 30-foot borders around every plot. So, I mean, that could be conventional soybeans, it could be organic soybeans. Um, our goal was to have the conventional organic look identical, and we pretty much have achieved that. So, um, in that 30-foot border, we plant a mixture of perennial grasses and legumes, and I talked to Kevin yesterday about that. That could qualify as the, the perennial border that's required in um, the A23, and Kevin will go into that, but just to put that out front. And then for everyone who's thinking about transitioning, you need three years between the last application of a prohibited substance. Say you use Roundup, um, you have to wait three years before you'd be certified organic. So we had to do the same thing here. We were coming out of a conventional uh, soybean and alfalfa, although the alfalfa fortunately didn't have any chemicals on it, but um, the soybean in the area did, and so we had to wait three years before we could certify this uh, farm or this experiment as organic. So that's the design. It's 44 plots, and what we're comparing is the typical corn soybean rotation versus three organic rotations, corn, soybean, oats, and alfalfa. So in general, most organic farmers are gonna mix intercrop, interseed, oats, and alfalfa together, um, getting that extra boost of nitrogen from the alfalfa. Then the next rotation we, are, we compare to the conventional is corn, soybean, oat, alfalfa, alfalfa, keep the alfalfa in there for an extra year and you'll see the benefits of that. And then uh, the last rotation is corn, soybean, corn, oat, alfalfa. So more corn in the rotation, 
which is going to cause a higher nutrient demand. So um, we'll talk about that in a minute here, too. So I'm just going to show one slide of what we do for organic for corn fertility regime. Um, just like if you're interested in working with NRCS, you need to get with the district conservation, soil conservation, resource conservationists, planners, sit down and figure out what your fertility regime would be, could be, should be. I did the same thing when I started. I met with USDA ARS soil scientists, Doug Carlin and Cindy Kimberdella, and they came up with our fertility regime for this LTAR experiment. So our corn follows oat alfalfa, which, as you know, fixes nitrogen. So you can take those nitrogen credits into your calculations. And we aim, I say aim because it's difficult to hit it right on because you're dealing with natural substances. We aim for a similar rate of nitrogen that we're putting on the conventional plots. So in the conventional plots, they're putting on urea at 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. In the organic, can't use synthetics, we're putting on four tons per acre of chicken manure, but it's only the third or fourth year in the rotation. So it's only for the corn crop. And I know some organic guys will put manure on for their small grain crop, and you need to add that into your calculation too. And what Cindy told us at that time is that it's only, she can only say it could provide 80 to 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre because of the difference in the manure every year, the difference in the weather, the difference in the volatilization, all these things you'll hear from Antonio and Kevin maybe. So um, just because you're putting on four tons per acre doesn't mean you're getting all that four tons per acre, or you're getting 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And we treat it as raw manure and put it on at least three months before harvest when the soil's above 50 degrees. Um, in the beginning years, we had this wonderful hoop house hog swine compost. Um, Unfortunately, and that was a mixture of manure and hay. And unfortunately, Iowa State ended that um, experiment. So now we buy, or this year it was donated, thankfully, um, poultry manure. And the analysis is about 2, 3, 4 NPK, um, which, you know, phosphorus could lead up to be a problem, but we check it every year. We do soil tests every year. And we have alfalfa in the rotation, which helps to balance that phosphorus. So uh, you'll hear this from Kevin, too, that NRCS is very concerned about um, folks using proper weed management. And we do feel that is as important as your nutrient nitrogen regime, because um, without good weed control, you won't have good yields. Um, we've done some experiments where we've compared with and without control. And without controls, it's a disaster. So f start out using preventative measures. Cover crops, especially rye, help with allelopathy. So all our um, corn crop is followed by a cover crop of rye, and that helps with weed management in the soybean crop. So crop rotations are critical for weed management. However, tillage is the most common method of control on organic farms. Um, don't know anybody that's doing 100% organic no-till. It's, it's very difficult to do. so. Um, for sure, you're going to see weed management equipment on, on organic farms. The first, one, uh, first operation is with a rotary hoe, and that is used when the weeds are first emerging. So timeliness is critical for organic weed management. And that's called the white thread stage, where these um, weed seeds are just beginning to germinate. And then at appropriate intervals to prevent weed seed establishment, production and establishment. And then following the rotary hoe, is a harrow or a cultivator, depends on your farm. We use a row cultivator. And make no mistake, with organic farmers, their goal is to till as little as possible because it costs money. So they, in general, the farmers I've worked with, and you can hear from three farmers today, and they'll talk about their operations, maybe two times for rotary hoe, and maximum three times with row cultivator. In general, it's two and two for us. At, at the Neely Kenyon farm, but we'll, we'll hear about the variation. Of course, a lot depends on the weather. When it's dry, you can get away with a lot, lot less tillage, but when it rains a lot, the weeds love it. So you do have to monitor. You'll hear about that from Kevin, how important that is to just don't till willy-nilly, but definitely make sure you're monitoring your weed populations before you use any tillage. What about insect and disease pest management? Fortunately, on organic farms, I have not seen this to be a problem. 
we have only sprayed an organic compliant pesticide once in 25 years. And that was for soybean aphid when it first came out. And what's the reason behind that? Well, that biodiversity I talked about that's required, that really aids in management of insects and diseases because you're conserving your beneficial insects. Here's a couple beneficials down here. Whoops, lacewing, and then the minute pirate bug and parasitic wasps that attack the soybean aphid. So you're conserving your beneficial insects. The cover crop in the orchard will help with conserving beneficial insects too. You're using resistant varieties. They are key in organic production. Fortunately, thanks, hats off to the breeders, we have really good corn varieties that are resistant to corn borer. We have resistant soybean cyst nematode resistant varieties. And now we have soybean aphid resistant varieties. So that is definitely encouraged on organic farms. And then if all those fail, you can use the least toxic organic compliant pesticide. So um, you can look on OMRI, Organic Material Review Institute, for a list of um, pesticides. As I said, I'm only using once in 25 years. It's one's called garlic barrier. That's a general insecticide, um, but it doesn't really hurt beneficial insects. So that's a good thing to use. So what kind of yields are we getting after using all these practices? Well, we've been able to achieve no statistical difference between the organic and conventional corn yields. So on the left is conventional corn soybean, and then on the right are the two organic rotations. And you can see with that extra year of alfalfa, you're going to get higher yields. So there's no statistical difference, but there's a numerical difference, 178 with the extra year of alfalfa um, compared to 180 in the conventional. So we, we encourage people to have as diverse a rotation as possible. You'll hear about some, well, I know some organic farms are doing eight year um, rotations, which is pretty amazing to us. Soybeans, same, no difference between conventional and organic. You can see us, I'm walking with the inspector through our organic soybeans there in that picture. And um, of course, soybeans fix their own nitrogen, so there should not be a difference, because nitrogen's the most limiting factor, as you know. So we've been averaging about 49, 50 bushels an acre of organic soybeans, and these are tofu soybeans, or soybeans destined for the food market. Um, and Occasionally, we will see numerically greater yields in the organic system. Oats averaging about 103 bushels per acre. I know some of the farmers here um, get higher yields than that, which I really um, am jealous of, but <laughs> we keep trying. And alfalfa, in the beginning years, it averaged about four tons per acre at the Altar, um, except 2012, we had that horrible drought where we had less than a ton per acre. But lately, because of the droughts we've been having every summer, we have been averaging about 3.5 tons per acre. Uh, what about returns? You do all these practices. Are you gonna get rewarded at the marketplace? Yes. Craig Chase, our ISU economist, has done extensive economic analysis of the LTAR and has shown that the organic returns are three to three and a half times the conventional system. And that's for twofold reason. One, you're lowering your production costs but you're also getting that organic premium price. So it's definitely uh, worth it to look at the economics too. I just have two slides on soil quality because Sabrina Roos from USDA ARS will be covering soil in more detail after lunch, but um, we were really lucky to work with Dr. Cynthia Cambridella from 98 to 2020. Many of you know her before she sadly passed away, but we're so happy that Sabrina is here to take her place and um, help us continue the analysis of soils at the LTAR. So Cindy sampled every fall in each plot, doing five randomly located soil cores, six down to six inches, and, har and did the soil sampling after harvest, but before tillage for any cover crops. And this is just one shot. Sabrina has more details, but um, showing higher soil um, carbon, carbon sequestration in the organic plots compared to the conventional. So the last one I'm gonna talk about is our organic no-till research. That's the holy grail for everybody. We would love for the organic no-till to be the model system. However, we've been working on it since 2005, and I can say that we're batting about 
what, 600, 60, 40. 60% 60 of the times it's worked really well, 40% not. Big reason, weather. And maybe you'll hear more about that from Scott Shriver and his organic no-till. Um, so we, we're, we're pushing it for both weed management and soil quality enhancement. We've looked at hairy vetch before corn, we've looked at rye before soybeans, and we've looked at hairy vetch and rye combined before vegetables. And in that system, if you're not familiar with it, you need a roller crimper, and the rye crop is, or in this case, this rye, the cover crop is planted in the fall, and then it's crushed with this roller crimper in the spring and planted behind it. You can also do them in separate operations if you don't have that set, that set up. So um, we averaged about 30, 35 to 40 bushels an acre organic soybeans in no-till systems, which I thought was really great considering we didn't do any weed management after that, after crushing the rye and planting into them. However, as always, the farmers did a lot better than us. Scott Schreiber, who you'll hear from this afternoon, he's achieved up to 64 bushels an acre with his um, soybeans in the crushed rye. He uses this true flex roller, um, but he'll, maybe talk about this year and the difference because of the dry weather. Um, organic no-till only works really well when it's perfect weather. And when do we have perfect weather <laughs> these days? Not too much anymore. And Levi Lyle, who we had a USDA um, NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant with, he obtained up to 56 bushels an acre um, with his organic soybeans in um, organic no-till. However, he did use a weed zapper. So after he planted, after the soybeans came up, after they were about a oh, foot, two feet high, he, did, he went in with a weed zapper and killed any remaining weeds. So um, if he didn't use a weed zapper, he, he had about 32 bushels an acre, which is still pretty good considering we're not doing any weed management. Um, we also looked at organic corn on his farm, no-till corn on, on Levi's farm. You can see the roller crimper there crushing the organic hairy vetch. Um, that system needs a lot more work because A, the hairy vetch does not die with the roller crimper, it continues to grow, and um, it's just very competitive. Even though it's fixing nitrogen, it's very competitive with the corn. So that corn ended up being chopped for silage. We didn't take it to full grain production. But one thing that was clear in all these experiments that soil quality, of course, will be much higher in the organic no-till because you're not tilling, you're not dissipating that carbon as uh, Sabrina will talk about and you're not um, destroying any of the microbial populations. So Cindy and Sharon Wires and other soil scientists in Morris, Minnesota found that microbial biomass carbon and microbial biomass nitrogen were greater in all five states of this project um, compared to the organic tilled plots and that residual soil nitrate, nitrogen, pH and electrical conductivity were also greater in the organic no-till than in the organic conventionally tilled in three out of five sites. And that's a shot there of our site where we compared um, corn going into hairy vetch, soybeans going into rye versus tilled systems. Um, bottom line, the soil quality was really good in the tilled systems. However, it was higher in the no-till system. So with that, I'm gonna end my presentation and just give a shout out to people that have really helped our ISU organic program, Albert Lee and Blue River Seeds, Scott Osborne shown there. This year we've been working more with Prairie Hybrid Seeds too. Um, the organic farmers shown here, you're gonna hear from later, Ron Roseman, Paul Muggy, and Scott Shriver, and also Tom Franson has been a great cooperator. Um, Iowa State and USDA NRCS and ARS, thank you very much. So with that, I'll move on to Kevin's presentation. We're gonna hold questions till the end so we can keep the program rolling if I can find Kevin I assume you want to start with the one called um, A23 yep that'll do it okay and you do have to stand in front of the microphone because we're on zoom and that's the only way they can see and hear you oh okay some of you know me I'm not great at just standing and right in front of the computer I kind of like to walk around a little bit um, but uh, we'll talk a little bit here of uh, NRCS and our conservation practices we utilize and our, specifically our organic management standard. Um, but uh, 
Before we uh, get into our conservation practices, I just want to talk a little bit about how we kind of do business, our process. Um, when a producer is interested uh, in working with us on conservation, um, generally that producer initiates that contact with us. Sometimes we'll do cold calls, but they have some resource concerns, some problems. Um, they may have some problems in the practice they want to implement, or it might be that they've heard about some programs we have and, and they want to take advantage of that and want to hear more about it. And so we like all of the above, any uh, opportunity we can get to work with producers and then learn more about their operation. Um, so and when we do that, um, and that initial contact's made, um, we want to, we ask a lot of questions and we want to spend a little time with that producer so that we truly understand the problems they have, the objectives that they're really looking at for their farming operation. Um, we want to um, understand what practices they were interested in, where they've uh, had good luck with certain different practices, which ones have, they have not. Um, the more we spend answering questions, open-ended questions to learn about that producer's system, then the better we are when we're looking at potential resource concerns to work with them for solutions that come back to really working for that producer's farm operation, meeting those producer's objectives, and, and getting the best practices tied in. Um, so none of this is, this is really uh, something that we cannot skip over when we talk about um, our 823 organic management standard practice. Because that we really have to know that complete system that that producer's either doing or looking at. Every trip across that field, um, how they're gonna do the weed control, how they're gonna do the nutrient management, what are they looking at for the crop rotations? All those things play in um, for meeting that standard. And, you know, are we looking at livestock operations and how does that fit in? Is it cattle operation, pasture systems? Um, so up front, we like to spend a lot of time with the producer and uh, then we want to walk the farm and that, that can open our eyes to looking at um, some of the concerns that that producer had, but we, all, we may find stuff that that producer hadn't thought of. So maybe we're out there for waterways and we've got some cuts and, and the producer uh, is looking at us for design work, cost share work for reshaping waterways. Well, when we walk that land, we may see an active gully and uh, we may see potential for filter strips along a stream. So those are things that by walking the ground that we can come back to that producer with and talk about those things and see if uh, they're interested uh, in working with any other potential resource concerns or practices. Um, and when we, do, when we do that and we're coming back to the producer, we've got these ideas and practices in mind and we're selling to the producer. And, but it's ultimately that producer's decisions on what they want to implement. And once we get that figured out, then we look at the program side of things. And so we have a lot of different program opportunities today and different funding sources. So some of that comes through NRCS or Farm Service Agency, USDA, uh, but some of that can come through um, uh, Division of Soil Conservation and Water Quality, our state partner agency. And uh, there's other sources out there also. So not only are we trying to get the right practices, once that producer's interested, we gotta try to pair up what are the right best programs to meet um, that for those uh, practices. Um, and, you know, through this process, it's uh, a lot of education happens. And so we're educating producers on potential resource concerns. We're educating producers maybe how to implement a practice like cover crops. But I will say that more so uh, as a planner, we get educated by every producer we, we work with. So when we get to learn that producer system, we can actually we're, um, take that to other producers that we're working with. 
And nothing's more true when we talk organic farming, because I'm certainly on a steep learning curve, and I know a lot of our planners are too. So, and, you know, we are going to really learn a lot of what it takes to implement organic farming from the producer, from you guys. Um, so we have an application. You know, um, that application can be can be signed at that point, but it might be signed in day one when you walk through the office. You heard about our 823 organic management standard practice, heard the funding's pretty lucrative, we can sign you up right then. Um, but we still need to then go through this process. And then um, once we develop that plan, then we can go ahead and for most of the, we can rank it. So based on what we're getting going to accomplish out there, we'll go through a ranking. And then if it gets pulled for funding, then we're going to develop that contract. Um, and so until that contract is developed, and that's the time for the producer when they sign that, that they're agreeing to go ahead and implement those conservation practices over those set amount of years. So up till then, there's, um, you know, there's, uh, you don't have to make that decision till that point. So when we think about conservation practices, we have them listed in our field office technical guide. And you can Google that, uh, like Iowa NRCS, and then FOTG, you'll click on that. Um, and, and under section four, it lists all of our conservation practices. And there's like 140. So there's quite a few. But really, there's none of them that, you know, I would say don't necessarily, I mean, so from an organic production standpoint, there's a lot of them there that can to benefit the organic producer. Um, and I talked about trying to match up those different funding sources whether it's EQIP or our conservation stewardship program, um, CRP, uh, uh, it's a big program in Iowa, and our partner with the division, and we have other sources with other partners, and some of you guys have heard of RCCP or um, through the USDA, so we, we have partners that are helping us sell conservation where we're still delivering the product, but we also now have partners that are getting USDA funds that will not only sell it, but they will also be implementing. So we'll talk a little bit about the organic management standard. Um, this is a new standard this year, nationally um, developed, and so we call it an interim standard, and then it was up to each state to decide if they were going to go ahead and offer it. And when they do these national standards, an interim like this, then we looked at that, and then we changed some things and tried to structure it in a way that would work best for Iowa. So it won't look exactly the same from state to state. Um, <clears throat> and this practice is much different than, than our typical uh, conservation practice standards. This practice is more of a list about what's required in order to meet this standard. So in that way, it's a lot different. Um, we've had this standard since February in Iowa. Now, we, um, the only funding we had for it was a different funding source through equipped organic transition initiative funding. And so you actually had to be new ground coming in that wasn't certified. And so we did 10 contracts through that this last year. Um, we don't think we're going to have that funding source again. But now EQIP is coming up, our regular EQIP process. This standard can be funded through the other EQIP um, dollars. And so it is available for those transitioning, but also available to existing organic uh, certified lands. So they'll, they'll now be able to take a look at it. Um, most likely this year, nationally, they're going to do some tweaking on this interim practice. I, I don't foresee any big changes, though. Um, I think this is in your folder. So when you look at our practices, 
Um, we have a standard, and then we have implementation requirements. I think in this case, the implementation requirements are a little more clear on what's required for the 823 standard. And so when we think about the, our standards, we list out general requirements. Any standard you pull up is going to have general requirements. And that is what the minimum it takes to implement those, uh, uh, that list in order to meet our standard. So that's, what, that's the critical thing for you guys to understand when we're talking about implementing this standard. And so when we, you want me in front of this thing, don't you? So when we look at our requirements list, um, on the top there, when you look at the actual uh, page two of it, it talks there about adhering to USDA's National Organic Program Standard. And it lists some of the different things out, and then there's a place there that we're gonna list that organic certifier. Now, it's important for you guys to realize from our perspective of NRCS, um, we're gonna help you implement this standard, and, and there's some things here that are a higher bar than what the NOP requires. But we are not in a position to really answer questions back to you guys on what it takes to be certified. Now, we wanna be knowledgeable about that, but it, it's good, it'll be half to you guys going to actually those certification folks to make clear on what you can and can't do. Because it gets a little tricky that we have these NOP rules, but the individual certifiers interpret those rules and they often interpret them differently. So it, it would put us in an impossible spot um, to do that. So you wanna have a close relationship with that certifier. Um, those that are transitioning for the first time and, and as we worked on that this year became aware of, sometimes those certifiers aren't involved much until year three. So that can be a little more challenging. For those of you guys that are already certified, you've already got that relationship. Um, on our crop rotation must include three of four main um, crop types. I think that's a pretty low bar. So you could be a corn bean with a cover crop and meet that system. So I don't think that's, that's uh, pretty obtainable. Um, but the organic certifier, some of them may require, if you had corn bean system with a cover crop, they might still require a small grain in there. Um, we, um, as Kathleen talked, uh, must uh, establish one perennial conservation buffer Again, I think that's a pretty low bar, and that can be what we call an introduced seeding. Um, you know, we'll probably push the native prairie and give us a little more wildlife benefits, pollinator benefits, but you know, we can, we can use introduced species for that also. This is where it gets to be more challenging. So our soil loss for this program needs to be to the tolerable soil loss level. And so for a lot of our soils, we're looking at five tons of soil loss. And so in these uh, tillage systems, and I'll go into this uh, just a bit later this morning, we'll get a little more into the soil loss part of this, how we figure it, and give you an idea of some of the soil loss predictions based on soil type. But it will be real critical as we're working with you to know every trip across that field so that we're able to look at that soil loss and try to come up with systems that'll get you down below that five tons. Um, must implement the 590 standard, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later, and Antonio's gonna give us an hour where he's gonna get in to a lot of the nutrient management. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a big lift there. The 595, our pest management standard, should be fairly easy. I'd say the biggest thing is if you're using any pesticides, so in the organic world, we can use some pesticides. And if you are, then we, we're gonna take a look at that then. And then we're uh, expecting in this standard to have some uh, scouting reports. 
um, with grazing. So this standard can be used for the um, cattle guy on pasture. It's not for the livestock uh, uh, fully contained. Um, so when we deal with producers with livestock and pasture systems, then uh, we're going to do a pasture uh, uh, grazing plan. I'll just touch on a couple things with our 590. Um, we, we, we need a soil test. And so when we look at our 590 standard, we look at Iowa State. So that 590 standard's based on Iowa State's recommendations, and also then we get involved in some of the um, Iowa State law when it comes with manure. So we take a look at all the publications there and then, you know, that, that's what we're going with. So certainly work close with Antonio on this. But we need a soil test, PK, uh, P, uh, pH, buffer pH. Um, normally, we're always talking about, with commercial P and K, we're looking at Iowa State's recs. So we're applying maintenance levels on our optimum, and we're not applying P and K on our high and very high testing soils. So the world changes with us in the manure. And so in manure, we can apply over the agronomic levels that are needed. But we need to run a P index. And that's an assessment for the risk level of losing that phosphorus in our surface waters. So we can have higher levels, but we have to run that assessment. And I'll talk about a few of those factors later. Um, nitrogen rates. This is a big one for more conventional producers. And so we use, uh, Iowa State uses corn nitrogen calculator. So that's what we use. We did put, it, it, it looks at the ratio of the price of, of, of N versus the price you're gonna get for a bushel of grain. Um, we did put some sideboards on that. So the maximum ratios that we can use. And so we have maximum rates tied to that. So in the manure world, that ratio, we allow um, a greater amount of nitrogen due to the complexity of, of, of the manure. So a 0.05 ratio, the main of Iowa, three-fourths, 80% of Iowa, and, and when you go to that calculator, it'll show the main in the southeast corner. And so we got 182 pounds that, and it can meet our standard. Now, I will say in the organic world, you know, with manure, and the conventional side, manure is a great resource. And we got more manure in Iowa than any other state. Um, but normally we're working with folks to try to maximize those in that nitrogen. Now we go over the organic side. You guys don't have a problem taking in credits because that's where you're getting it. But now we're working you up more so maybe on the phosphorus that we can get higher levels of that. And so that becomes more critical. Did I just flip through hitting stuff? Okay. Well. There it's where I was. Okay. So and the last thing I'll mention here is when we're dealing with manure, we follow Iowa law. And so on sensitive areas, that we have to account for them. It's not too, if we incorporate or inject, we're good to go next to these perennial water bodies. And, and um, if we uh, don't and we surface apply it, we need 50 foot of a filter strip. Um, otherwise, we've got to have a 200 foot setback. So what we're going to encourage organic production, we, we might getting that incorporated, but we still like to see that filter strip because that, that does a lot of good for us on catching any sediment leaving the field also. So it has multi-purposes. Um, if you go into our field office technical guide, besides that organic management standard, and you go down to nutrient management, you'll see our standard for that. So in that, we have what we call a guidance document. And it's a five section, um, and what it does is when we created that, there was over 20-some different publications in Iowa law that we looked at. So we try to bring that in to that guidance document to highlight those critical things. And then we show in there every place 
that you can go to for more information. So that is a really good, I think, a resource for producers and our planners to take a look at to know what it takes to meet that 590 standard. Um, so the first section, soil testing, P, P, K, P, H. Second section is on nitrogen. The third, that sensitive areas we were talking about. The fourth is manure management. And a lot goes into that manure management. It's, you know, with the complexity there. And then the fifth is more for us when we're implementing a couple of our standards. Um, I think I pretty much hit on the 595. Um, it, 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 it should be a fairly low bar because we're just not applying any or no pesticides in organic, but we can, there are certifiable organic products. And of course for the weed control, we're gonna learn so much from you guys. But um, it, 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 uh, it's a much, much more complex system with organic than corn bean conventional. I feel like once you start working in organic systems, you look back and you think, boy, that other was pretty much an easy button. So like I said before, that 823, it really creates a higher bar for some things than than NOP requires. Um, and when we look at the, so I kind of went through the general criteria. There's a lot listed for additional criteria. So know that the additional criteria doesn't have to be met to meet the standard, but it's there like all, all of our practices have additional criteria. So that if your objectives or there's other resource concerns that you want to do a better job with, that we can look at that. The only thing I'll say is when we do the ranking, which we don't have the ranking for this program that'll be used coming up, um, we potentially could use some additional uh, considerations in the ranking. But if we do, you'll know about that and we'll go over that with you. So I wasn't going to go into too much deal, uh, detail on additional criteria. How much time do I have left? Three minutes. Three minutes. So, because there is quite a bit there, and there's been questions asked on that uh, on the additional criteria. So, um, so we look at the funding. You know, it's under equip. The application sign at any time. And the sooner you do, then that gives our folks more of a chance uh, to get together with you, figure out um, you know, your systems, what additional practices that we can complement with the 823. But the deadline that we're gonna pull the rankings is on November 3rd. So we'll pull those at that point. And if you, haven't, if you don't have an application and you won't be on that next funding cycle. So that, that's kind of a critical uh, deal there. Yeah, I think I covered most of that. We get into payment scenarios. Uh, the incentives we give are always important. And so when we look at that, a lot of folks that are on a little bigger scale are gonna be around 200 plus dollars an acre for this 823. And we can take other practices to help meet that standard and we can also give incentives for that. So, you know, this coming year, that's looking pretty lucrative. Um, but when we get into the small producer or produce, vegetable producer, maybe they're four, five, six, seven acres, then that price scenario changes. So as, as high as $1,800 an acre. But that's a completely different system, so. And we get into figuring some simple commodity, complex commodity stuff that kind of goes into coming up with that scenario payment. Contracts, um, three to five years. So new ground coming in, or you're existing, we can go three to five years. 
and we don't know the funding levels for 2024, but funding levels are going up as far as across the board on our conservation programs. And then Iowa will have to decide kind of how much we're putting into to this organic um, uh, the pot and then and do rankings accordingly. And like I said before, so we're looking at 823 that's getting a lot of organic management standard, getting a lot of interest, but we're also looking at any other practice that helps you implement that, that can, we can put that in the contract, but we're also looking at other conservation practices that are needed on the farm can be part of that contract and part of that plan. So we'll be looking at across the board. So with that is, we're going to save it. So I'll give it back to you then. Thank you, Kevin. Um, now I would like to call Antonio Malarino to the podium to, you heard Kevin mention um, several times about Iowa State University um, calculations, research, being involved in this. Um, Josiah, could you come up here and find Antonio's, please? About Iowa State University being involved in these calculations, and we're really lucky to have with us today Dr. Antonio Malarino, who has 30 years of experience working on nutrient management at Iowa State University. And sadly for us, he retired, so <laughs> we are very grateful that he came in, even in his retirement status, to talk to us um, about nutrient management, which is his expertise. And um, remember, he, we'll, we'll be available, we're gonna have a full discussion period after Kevin comes back up and presents some calculations um, that will be useful in your applications. But this is a broad overview um, that Antonio so kindly agreed to give us on um, nutrient management with emphasis for organic farming. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's nice to see uh, three or four old friends, twice old, old because I met them in 89 of 90, and we are old, <laughs> so it's very good. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for the invitation. Um, you know, she asked me to talk about so many things, and then, uh, so I need to say a couple of disclaimers. First of all, she knows more about nutrient management with organic farms than I know, you know, but she wanted me to talk anyway. The other is that um, uh, I, I, I really encourage all organic farmers to really look and participate at our guidelines and attend, you know, other type of extension things that we have. Because you see, there is no magic. I mean, organic or not, the, the loss of uh, nutrient cycling and what happened you know, in the soil are about the same. So many of the things that we have done with uh, fertilizers, or manure, et cetera, uh, some of the principles apply to organic farmers. So don't, please be, be open-minded about that. You know, I think it's important. And the other thing is that I, I'm not an expert. For example, every time I get a question about compost, it's mainly about the nitrogen availability, I immediately send it to Kathleen, you know? So you want to see anything about compost here, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, those that have listened to me before know that for every single word I say that we recommend, I have tons of data and I show tons of data. Today, I can't. Otherwise, I will need three hours here. And, and I'm still, I may be in trouble. So you yell at me when we have about five minutes left. Um, but, uh, so some of the slides are heavy. I will try to uh, emphasize the, the guidelines and some of the concepts, not to justify 
um, with data. You see what I have. Otherwise, it would be impossible. So everybody can um, uh, send me an email. I can share this this presentation. Okay. I don't know if it will be posted somewhere, but uh, feel free to email me. Okay. Okay. The a few things before we start, you see. Uh, of course, there are all kind of restrictions um, for use of common and low cost fertilizers, you know, with organic farming. I'm not an expert, and I will not say one word about all kind of bio things that salesmen are trying to sell to organic farmers. You know, I'm not going to get into that. That's a, that's a kind of worms. Uh, so, in, in general, for organic farmer, we have no problems for lime, pH, lime management, uh, sulfur, and micronutrients, because you can use uh, cheap, low cost, and available sources like lime, you know, sulfates, you know, uh, gypsum, things like that. Uh, the, the key, in my opinion, is to talk about manure, you know, manure management. And I will not go too deep, but it is important because animal manures are great in terms of the nutrient value. We have done lots of research, um, but um, the ratios of the nutrients are not necessarily what uh, is needed, you know, in, in, in a particular field or for crops. And by the way, I work mostly with corn and soybean, alfalfa, pastures, not with vegetables, okay? So that's, that's another area that is not in my expertise. So, but I think it's important, you know, because uh, you need to understand these issues in order to balance the, the nutrition in an economic way. Because even if, if you use your own manure, things like that, uh, I mean, you need to consider the economics because organic farmers need to survive the same as normal farmers, you know, and farmers are getting larger, you know, so the management is complicated and so forth. Um, so the, uh, a, few, a few things about manures in general. See, first of all, there is no organic potassium in, in manures or in crop resin, okay? The, the potassium is, is as a ion, okay? So in terms of the availability, whatever is there will be available, of course, after reacting with the soil, okay? So, yeah, I know that for you guys, there are some organic case sources, you know, but in, in, in crops and in, and in manure, it's just the, the potassium ion. Now, we do have a combination of several uh, inorganic and organic forms for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, you know, in manure. So this is a complicated things because uh, we have all these environmental soil factors that um, determine what happens once you apply the manure. Uh, all these reactions, you know, in the soil, losses, volatilization, things like that. And see, in, in general, uh, the inorganic forms that are soluble and immediately available, they follow the same uh, processes that fertilizers do. See, they can be lost, they can be volatilized, you know, all the stuff. The other problem with manures is that they are very heterogeneous, you know. Uh, really, there is very high sampling variability, and also in the analysis. So often there is a very large difference between the preliminary analysis that you take from the tip or from the pile with what actually supply different loads in the field. And we have worked with that, with John Sawyer and I, with swan manure liquid, with poultry manure, and I work with beef manure too, a large project. Uh, the other thing is the uniformity of application. See, it's not easy to apply manure <coughs> uniformly, especially with solids. Dry, dry manure, but also with liquid manure because you need to have a good flow meter, you know, you need to have patience, you need to agitate all the things. And then the issue we have is that, I believe Kevin mentioned that, you know, is that if you go with the M-based manure, uh, the rate that the corn needs uh, uh, in some systems, 
pretty soon you will have phosphorus in the soil sky high. So uh, we need to be careful, and the management is complicated. Now, we have a bunch of publications, uh, okay, in Iowa State. You can find all of this in the, in the extension publication store or in the soil fertility website, see? And, uh, and if you go to the soil fertility website, you will see all these nutrient topics, manure, nitrogen, phosphorus, etc. So you can take a look at, at these things. And what I did, I just put some tables here that are in the publication exactly, it's just some cosmetics differences um, for you to understand. The, the, a, a key publication is PMR 1003 that we updated it, you know, a few months ago, but most of the things are the same, except the examples. So this, this comes from research, except from Iowa research. We did lots of research, you know, into these numbers. As I said, I'm not going to bore you to death showing slides, but if you want to, send me an email and I can show that. So. These are the, the different manures. We don't have in the state, we in Iowa State at least, we don't have much information for a dairy, dairy manure or for um, an aerobic lagoon, so we borrow some of these from neighbor states. Usually we do that. Now, there's a bunch of footnotes there that are important. So here I just reduce them in, in a few words. Uh, otherwise, you know, you could not be able to read that in one slide. But you can take a look in that publication. Essentially, is the estimates for nitrogen availability do not consider, in this table, do not consider volatilization losses, okay? While it is applied or after it is applied. The ranges in P and K are mainly there because we know uh, we have all this research and in most situations, the availability is about 100% for, for P and K, things like that, if it is applied in the fall, mainly, or very early in the spring. But uh, we recognize uh, all these issues we have, the sampling variability, <clears throat> the uniformity application, all that stuff. So essentially, to cover our butts, you know, we put these ranges there. And, and for P and K, we suggest that when the soils are, are, are very low or low, that they use the lower availability estimates because you cannot afford to have a major yield loss there. But when you are maintaining, with that's what most farmers are doing in Iowa, um, organic or not, then assume 100% availability. Uh, now, uh, the other thing is this uh, nitrogen volatilization factors, and I have not worked with that. Others are engineers, you know, and others have worked on this. Uh, so this is the best knowledge that uh, we have, that the NR have been using. Um, so, uh, so you can look at these factors. The only thing that, this is my bias, is that, see, there is all kind of solid manures out there. Some that they can have 80% moisture, others that are essentially dry. So in my opinion, especially if with nitrogen, be aware that if you are applying dry manure, most likely what was going to be volatilized was done already. So now maybe the NR doesn't like that too much, or, or they are engineers, I'm looking at one here, but uh, that's, that's important. I mean, if the manure is dry, most likely whatever was going to be lost for volatilization is gone already. So be careful with that. Um, the issue of the manure availability for second and third years, okay? We have that explained there well and discussed. Not all of the manure and will become available over time, okay? Some of the, uh, the soluble sources will be lost the same when you apply a hydros or any other fertilizer, you see. And uh, so it is, it is uh, some of the organic nitrogen is recalcitrant, you know, that may not be available there. So uh, we have all this percent, you know, for the second year, you know, for, for liquid soil manure, we say zero. Essentially, there's not much available in the second year unless you have a long history of manure application and compare that, you know, with a field that you just apply manure once, you know. But honestly, uh, 
<laughs> and that's my last sentence there. You guys know what I, I say, what I think. Uh, I, all this business, all these estimates for availability for second and third year, uh, take that with a, a big pill, you know, because I, I, it's extremely valuable. Um, okay, this is just, um, and, um, and Kapil and others can, can correct me, or even Kevin. These are the, the concentrations of manure that DNR um, asks people to use for manure management plans. You know, these are, are there in this Midwest plan service stuff. So you have there all kind of things, all kind of uh, uh, concentrations, you know, of uh, total nitrogen, ammonium, total phosphorus, total potassium, et cetera, and so forth. But uh, in the real world, we need to analyze the, the manure. You can't go by the tables. You need to sample in spite of the variability. You have to do that. Okay, and I put here, this, this is not from Iowa, it's from Minnesota, but it, it's very nice because it shows the, the nutrient concentration, pounds per ton or pounds per 1,000 gallons for N, P, and K for different manures here. I don't know if you can see the, no, you cannot, yeah, you can see the, the cursor there. So we have, for all of them, we have total nitrogen, the black, uh, the ammonium in the manure. See, the ammonium is immediately available. Much of liquid soil manure, uh, I mean, 70 to 90% is, 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 is ammonium, not ammonia, ammonium, uh, okay? Uh, but in other manures, we have less, less ammonia. So thi but this gives you an idea. These this, uh, bars show the, the upper and the lower uh, percentiles, 25% and 75%, just to have an idea of, of the variability out there, okay? So as I said, you, I, if you send me an email, I can send you this. Um, then uh, we, uh, with uh, Mazar Hack, who has been my assistant scientist for, for many years, uh, we work, you know, with a total analysis of, of the manure. So it is important that you need to consider that the manures apply sulfur and apply micronutrients, okay? So uh, it's the, 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 the probability that you have a, a micronutrient deficiency of sulfur when you use manure is essentially zero. I mean, it could happen. And then for some uh, manure sources, we didn't have data, so I borrowed some from uh, a friend from Kansas. And uh, so you can see here, these are pounds per ton as is, uh, and pounds per gallon as is. So when you're applying manure, you're applying lots of micros and sulfur there. So you may have to apply some in some situations. Um, now, the variability. In the, in, in the analysis, in the sampling, is very high. We recognize that. So all these availabilities that we show is the theoretical availability. That's what the availability is. But once you apply that, all kind of things can happen. The inorganic fractions may be lost, you know, you may be retained by the soil, all kind of things. So, so we work with John Sawyer a lot with this because in our, all our on-farm trials, we, an, we have a preliminary sample that, that we took from the pit or the pile or whatever. But then each load that we were applying in the field, be strips, you know, large plots or, or small plots applied by hand, we analyze the actual concentration of what was being applied, okay? And I have all kind of graphs about this. So I decided to put just two. If you look at the one in on the left, you see we have the preliminary test in the y-axis, and then the test as applied when we analyze really the loads. And you can see, oh, yeah, but there's a very good correlation. Yes, there is a good correlation. But look, for example, at phosphorus. Look at the, uh, 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 the gray triangles. It's huge, the variability. I mean, you may be off by 20, 30, 40, pounds per acre. And with the potassium, it's not as bad for some reason. And nitrogen, there is some, some variability. So be careful with that. You see, we recognize that. 
See, one thing is availability with a perfect analysis and sampling. Another thing is what really you are applying, what happened there, okay? So you need to be very careful with manure. And in the right, we have just the, the, is, is the number of applications for P, K, all kind of things. Uh, what is the, 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 the intended rate here, okay, what we tried to do, but then the number of applications that we got certain, certain within certain margins of that, you know. And it's, it's, it's huge. Sometimes we are way off. And this was research. And we analyze each load. You guys don't analyze each load. So be careful with this, okay? It is very important to consider that. So in my view, key things to best use of manure uh, nutrients. There are high concentrations of available nutrients, okay? There is inorganic P, of course, K is inorganic, potassium is inorganic. So all this, when you apply into the soil, is subject to the same processes that happen to many of the, of the fertilizers. The nitrogen can be lost, can be volatilized, the P and K can be lost with erosion and runoff, can be retained by the soil, all these things, okay. Uh, we need lots of um, time and management for manure. You guys know that. It's not easy. Some people believe, oh, yeah, you know, I have farmers a bunch of, see, they don't care, you know, about manure, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I, I like to see them really management and trying to live with applying manure. I mean, it is, it is tough. So the manure sampling, if you are not doing your own soil sampling, ask many questions to the guy that is doing the sampling, okay? Uh, what, how were the samples taken? Uh, how many from each pit or pile or, or what? Uh, be patient with the calibration. You need to spend time with the calibration. I mean, especially with solid manure. I mean, it just takes time, you know, to do that. And you need to maintain that equipment well. Again, time. Don't apply in a hurry. Look what you're doing. I know everybody's busy. You want to be done before dark or before rain. But it is important that you pay attention to what you're doing. Then in the, terms, in the soil sampling, uh, soil sampling is, is, is good. I mean, the, the, all the analysis for P, K, et cetera, measure the P and K available in the soil as well in manure fields or when fertilizer is applied. I, I, unless you apply manure and take the soil samples, you know, a month later, you know, you need to wait until it reacts into the soil. So don't sample in a hurry. There is an incredibly high small scale variability, okay? And uh, you need many more samples, composite samples, and cores per sample than in fertilized field. Yeah, Ron knows that very well. You see, uh, see, remember, we started working on this in 89 and 90 in some of your fields. So, uh, and then be sure you sample to a six inch depth. You see, because with any tillers, you know, till or whatever, except with the old plow, you know, mobile plow, we have this stratification, you see. So if you sample three, four inches, or you sample six inches or eight, you get a different number. See, this is something that, of course, I don't say that too much, but I can say it here. It's so easy to cheat. See, depending on the sampling depth, you can get higher or lower values. So you need to be truthful, you need to do that. I mean, you need to be careful about the sampling depth. Okay, nitrogen. Much of the research we have is done with an organic fertilizers, but we do have all this research uh, looking at the availability of uh, nutrients in manure, okay, uh, as I showed before. So many of the principles apply. These are some extension publications that we have in Iowa State. And 
some of the old friends here may remember, you see, the, 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 the uh, late spring nitrate test. I was working with Fred Blackman in 89, 1992, and, and continue working with uh, John Sawyer on that. Now, I doubt many are using remote sensing, you know, but okay, these are publications that please, uh, when you have time, take a look at those. There is very useful information, organic farming or not. Uh, so the nitrogen is, is a pain in the neck, you see. It's very challenging because of all the reactions that happen in the soil. And uh, nitrogen is very mobile. The transformation of organic nitrogen to mineral nitrogen the plants can absorb, you see, is affected by all kinds of things. Uh, there is much temporal variability during the season. If you apply in the fall, you apply in the spring, and then you take a measurement, there is huge variability. It, the, it is very difficult and uncertain to predict what is the optimal economic rate for nitrogen. It doesn't matter what the source is. And I know that you organic farmers have other considerations and don't care too much if you get maximum yield, you know, as your neighbor gets and so forth, because you put other values, you know, in the production. But, but you need to be careful, you know, about that, because you need to be sure that you are investing, you know, you're getting something. I mean, if you are farming organic or not, you want to make some profit with that. You need to send your kids to college or school, you know, so you need to be careful about it. Uh, so. Uh, essentially, uh, it doesn't matter how much richer we do, it's impossible to predict accurately the nitrogen rate that the corn needs pre-plant because of what happened in April, in May, early June. That may determine what happened. You see, so all these efforts in terms of predict the optimum and rate, fertilizer or manure, you need to be aware of that. It's always a huge gamble. No matter what people tell you, trust me. And I bet those of you who have done on-farm research, you know that. Okay, these are just examples of two long-term rotations that have had, you know, alfalfa and several types of, of rotation with corn uh, in, in the Kanawa research farms and the uh, Northeast farms. And I'm not gonna go in details. I just put, see, here below, you see the, 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 the C is corn, oats is, is oats, and there's some with alfalfa, and A is the alfalfa second year, okay? So, um, so you can look here at the, at the rotation effect. This is a nitrogen response, you see? This is the nitrogen rate, and of course, the more there is, the more is the yield. But you look at the green uh, curves, that's when it was after alfalfa. Now, I put these arrows because you have to note in this, in this side we have only the seeding year and the loads and then one year, okay? And then in, in here, in the northern farm, we have two years. So we have the, the oats with the alfalfa seeding uh, and then we have two more years, you see? So, these nitrogen needs here are, 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 are higher than if you have three, four years of alfalfa well managed. And that's why we have some recommendations that we'll share, you know, later on. But there is no doubt, you know, and then of course we see that no matter what you do with the continuous corn, you have lower yield because of the rotation effect. See, I'm not gonna go into that because you guys know that, you see the value of crop rotation. See, when I came to Iowa, after being working, I started working in 1972. Uh, I, I grew up in a, in, in a dairy farm. You see, so most of the pastures there are in rotation with crops. You see, essentially there's no continuous wheat or continuous corn, or things like that. And, and, and the pastures are not permanent here. You see, how many people out there do actually use uh, rotation with pastures, you know? Very few. Either you have these permanent pastures or you have the corn and soybean. Very few, likely most of you, have this rotation, see? Now, it's difficult, 
You see, some people in the ivory tower, when there's the university, say, oh, you know, I offer a bunch of videos, they just plant corn and soybean. Well, you know, it's tough. We cannot compete with alfalfa from, from the Great Plains, you know. Here you can get three harvests or four, and you're lucky if one or two don't get wet. You know, it, it's tough, you know. So, but we need to keep working on that, you know, and this concept of the, of the rotation for a variety of reasons, economics, the environment, and so forth. Okay, now, you may have heard about this MRTN, the maximum return to end. Please pay attention to this, because even organic or not, you need to make a profit. So you need to know, and some things that we have based on fertilizer research, but using those availabilities that I showed before, as, as uh, Kevin uh, indicated, you can use this as a guideline for that. What is that? Is, is, is this, this the law of diminishing returns? Okay, these are here, this is hypothetical, of course. So for each, each increment after the zero, see, you get an increase in, in yield, but for each increment that you increase the rate, the yield response is less, 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 and less proportionally. So the concept is where the heck you should be. Do you want to be like many Iowa farmers that they apply more nitrogen than they need? Okay, and uh, or you want to be here that you are losing money because you're not applying nine nitrogen. So that's, that's the importance of, of the concept. And it doesn't matter what nitrogen source you're using. You need to know this, please. It, it's easy, okay. So you can, this is, a, I, I did this with data that, uh, Sawyer and I and others and Sotirius lately got, you know, this is our things in the corn after soybean in the end rate, corn end rate calculator. You see, the optimum end rate for corn has increased over time. See, there is a huge variation, you see, from year to year, but in general. So you need to be aware of this. Don't, don't keep doing things that you used to do 20 years ago. They may not apply now. Okay, so you need to look into that. Uh, the end rate calculator, you know, was last updated last year, and now with all these new trials, you know, that we are doing out there, you know, we may get more information. Uh, but this is very useful. It's a seven-state project, okay? I, well, here you have all, all the universities. That everybody agree that this is one way of Estimating, having an idea what the optimum end rate could be for different situations. is for continuous corn and corn after soybean. We do not have a calculator after alfalfa or pasture. We have other, other ways of doing that. So I'm not going to go in detail. I'm just asking you, please, when you have a chance, you're bored someday, some Sunday, uh, go there and check it. It is a very useful thing because when you input the price of the fertilizer, the, the, the price of the manure nitrogen, you see, using those availabilities, you know, that we showed before. You see, you can have an idea uh, what is the profitability that you can expect. And you need to be profitable, darn it, organic or not. Unless you have a job in town, you know, you get lots of money, and you're a weekend farmer. But, uh, okay, so we have this output, and, and the key things is here. You see, those are the net returns. These are returns to nitrogen dollars per acre, not yield. And, of course, if you apply little nitrogen, uh, you don't have much profit. If you apply too much, then you have a, a loss on the investment. You see, but... The end rate calculator give you this I call sand dogs. The maximum return based on the data set is the center diamond. But then you have the sand dog, the, the lower and the higher. And that shows that it's, see, it may be just a 20, 30, 40 pounds of nitrogen difference, but the net return it's just plus minus one dollar per acre. So 
people, some people say, oh, the Enrico Coletti is not flexible. Of course it's flexible. You can do it, you can do whatever you want. So you can use the, 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 the maximum return to end, you can use the, the higher sun dog. That's what most people in conventional farms do, okay? And, uh, or you can use the lower one. If you're sure that you want to get some good return, see, without applying too much, you see? So, uh, so it is useful, as I said before. Hey, it's difficult to get the, the, the right rate. And a couple of people in Iowa are working with models, all the, all the stuff, and they're good luck, you know. Uh, but, you see, this is the neat thing. You can play with it. See, you can say, okay, I'd like to know corn after soybean in southeast Iowa or the rest of Iowa, in, given the database, and I show you before, you know, we have data since 2003, I deleted some old data. You see, this is the probability of, of uh, uh, the number of, of sites in the database that you get this economic optimum end rate. Okay, uh, so if the nitrogen is cheap, organic or not, then you see you can have this range of, of, of rates. So you look at that and say, okay, I will go for X rate. See, that, that's, that's what it is. See, in the past, before 10, 15 years ago, we were doing all this research, you know, every year, and then every three, four years, we changed the recommendation. Now we have it there. You can see it. And then you can do what you want. Now, if you have expensive nitrogen, then, oops, well, see, you need to be careful. Now, this is the issue. Most IO farmers are about here. They are applying more nitrogen they need. Now, many of them in the agribusiness believes that our recommendations are too low. That's why they gave a million dollars per year, you know, for this new nitrogen initiative. But, you know, they will find the same thing that we were finding in the last few years. So uh, this, this is important. This is the value of this, that you can see what you want. Now, it is unfortunate that you guys cannot use liquid fertilizers, you know, uh, because what I recommend to people is to use a conservative rate pre-plant. See, so you're sure that you have the nitrogen that the corn needs to start. And then, after emergence, go with some tools, in-season diagnostic tools. The late spring test, as I said, we could have data for, you know, 35 years with that. Nobody wants to do it, you see? But it is a way that you can do it. You can look at the rain. John Sawyer has in the, in, in the fertility uh, website the correlation, you know, when you have more or less rain, say, from April to May. So you can do some guessings. Maybe in the future we have some, some model. I don't know. Now, of course, you can do side dress of liquid soil manure, you know. But, you know, we have all these issues. But, uh, you see, th the late spring test I put here, this comes from this publication, Crop 3140. See, these are the worst case scenario for the late spring test. When we apply manure, this is liquid manure pre-plant, this is solid manure uh, pre-plant, I think it was poultry. I don't remember. You see, so if you look at the here's corn yield increase, okay, this is not the yield, this is the yield increase, okay, and this is the late, the late spring test <clears throat> number, sampling one foot, you know, and V5, V6, V7, something like that. You see, uh, the test is, is not good at telling you how much nitrogen you need if you have less than about 30, 25, 30 parts per million. So my friend John Sawyer was always, in my opinion, too negative about this test. Because any eh, farmer don't want to use it, you know, and then we have all this variability, you know, that you have 10, 15 ppm, and you don't know how much nitrogen really you need to apply extra side dress. Well, hell, but at least it's something. I mean, if you look from the other side, especially in manure fields, you see, you have, you know, 25, 30 parts per million there, 
and the probability that you need more nitrogen is essentially zero. Now you need to take several samples, you need to be aware of the variability and all those things. And, and, and here, this is all in manure, look at that. So it's like the, ha the, the, the glass is half full or half empty. I think this is a nice tool. And if you are concerned about the environment, you would do it. You see, or maybe remote sensing, you see, maybe this chlorophyll meter stuff, you know, all these things that you can do to assess. Now, in your case, because you are organic, I don't have a clue. I don't think you can dribble the UAN. I'm not sure if you can apply urea sometimes. Can you guys apply urea? You can. See, so you could side dress with liquid fine manure. That's what you could do, because if you side dress with manure applied over the top, you know, that, that doesn't work. So, yeah, you guys are in some tough things. This is a table just come from this publication, Crop 3073, that John Sawyer prepared. Uh, these are the recommendations after alfalfa or alfalfa grass pastures. As I told you before, we are using data. I remember in the, in the, in the 90s, there were lots of experiments. You know, I helped some of those in, in corn after alfalfa. And uh, so these, these are the, the recommendations. We always, see, you will see that we, sometimes we say, uh, coarse texture, soil, sandy soil, use corn following soybean. You see, in the end rate calculator for that. In other cases, we say zero to 30 pounds per acre. I mean, it's impossible to be more precise. Now, if you have a good stand, four years alfalfa, and then you plant corn, I would not apply one atom of nitrogen there. But we need to cover our butts, <laughs> okay? So, uh, and this is realistic, see, uh, especially with, uh, um, uh, first year uh, of corn after alfalfa, second year, you know, there is lots of work in Minnesota. I actually, we had some trials together with University of Minnesota and Iowa State that we shared data, okay? Um, okay, P and K, where am I? Um, again, uh, there is no magic, guys. It doesn't matter if you are organic or not. The soil test tells you if you need more P and K. The only caveat is that with, with, with manure application, organics, you see, maybe you have better um, physical properties. And maybe there is better exploration of the soil by the roots, okay? So in, in terms of the uncertainty uh, of, of trying to use a soil test value, you see? Well, yeah, maybe you can expect that uh, could be, uh, uh, the soil test could be a bit low, lower, what? One ppm, two, three ppm? Now, you're gonna risk that. So, and you should, with phosphorus, that will not be the issue, because most likely you have lots of phosphorus there. And the problem is if you put too much, but with potassium, you need to be careful, because especially if you have some piles there, you know, and you get rain, you know, that, that potassium can be leached. So you need to be careful when you use manure. Yes, be careful with the nitrogen. Be careful with the application of uh, uh, too much phosphorus, you know. You need to use the P index, all that stuff. But watch potassium. I've seen tremendous potassium deficiencies with farmers that have been using manure, and they were happy with that. And until we went and we did the trials, so you see the deficiencies, you know, be careful with that. So all, all these things, all these publications, there's lots of information there. Please have some time, even in the winter, to read them. Okay, soil sampling. I'm not gonna, it's just one slide, okay? Those that know my reason know that since I came to Iowa, 30 years ago, I think that the, the, the fields in Iowa are one inch lower, you know, all the samples that, I, that we have taken, you know. But I tell you, be careful. You need to be careful by taking soil samples. Now, most likely you guys do your own sampling, but be careful if somebody else do it. Everybody's in a hurry. 
Uh, one year, some guys are sampling. The next year or two years from then, it's a different guy. The bias is different. Be careful. And in my opinion, and it's not that I, <laughs> that I want an RCH or DNR to require, but in this in the, in the 21st century, you need to do some zone sampling. The ideal is the grid sampling, two, three, four acres. But if not, do some uh, zoning based on the on on this in, in other things other than the soil series and the, and the soil map, because those beautiful maps digitized that we have showing all the soils, I mean the border between one soil and the other, maybe 200, 300 feet away. Be careful with that. You can use aerial photos. You don't need something too expensive. You know, use things to do a better sample. Okay, that's it. Uh, so I, I honestly think that we cannot continue doing things like in the past. This business of taking samples every four or six years, come on, doesn't make sense. You need to get more samples. Now, every time I tell farmers to do grid sampling, to sample every two years with some zone sampling, they say, oh, I cannot afford it. However, most farmers out there, they're applying lots of snake oil, you know, spending 20, 40, 50 dollars per acre that doesn't do anything. And that happened with some organic products too. So be careful with that. So uh, it, it is important. Now, we updated the PNK uh, suggestion this fall. The last was in 2013. So there were some major changes based on data. So I took this from PM 1688. You can see that the publication, it is free. Take a look at that. I just simplify some of the, tab the tables. Okay, in the, and I know you hate many graphs. These are just few that I'm gonna show. This is the relative yield response, the classic soil correlation research with yield response, okay? So in terms of relative yields, you have very low test, you know, you have a huge yield response. If you are high, you have no response. And here in red is the, uh, the old interpretations until last year, and here in blue are the new ones, okay? These are the ones that I put here for all the soil tests that, that we do. And here is the probability of response. You see, we are only one or two states in the North Central region that for 15 or 20 years, we have put in our publication what the heck these classes mean. What is the probability of response? Based on what? So this is what we want. That's why we change them. Increasing what we require, we suggest to maintain. Increasing a little bit. You see, mostly the, the main difference, if you compare the red lines with the blue, is that we made the optimum, which is what we recommend to maintain, wider. It was too narrow, just four ppm. That's within the error, you know, that we get out there. So we made it higher and up, uh, because we believe that P and K is, 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 should be the, 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 the basis for good production, organic or not. Uh, and then manage nitrogen according to that. Uh, here are, is the yield increases. You see, uh, see, I mean, look at that. See, corn yield, you can have 10 to 100 bushels per acre response in the very low, low. Organic or not, take a look into that. And if you are high, heck, there will not be much response. However, three quarters of the farmers in Iowa are in this high or very high, and they keep applying maintenance. We have been fighting for that for how many years? Frustrated, I will retire frustrated because they just listen to the dealers, most of them, not all. Hopefully you don't. Okay, so potassium is almost as complicated as nitrogen. And I have been working so much with potassium, with manure or no manure and the deficiencies. So we also increase a bit what we suggest to, to maintain. 
You can take a look at that. This is the same type of graph. We have the data. Each of these points is an experiment in a field. I don't use models. I don't use smoothing. I hate that. I want to show the actual numbers because this is a real thing. This is the variability that we have out there. Okay? These are the yields. We have the dry test. We have the moist test. You know, you can look at all the things. The, this shows that this moist test that we started recommending since 2013, which is the old uh, moist test that Iowa State used to do until 88 when my senior peers in what I think was one of the worst mistakes in soil fertility done in Iowa State, they abandoned it because the soil testing labs don't do it. They didn't do it, so they decided to change it. Uh, and if you have those uh, um, poorly drained soils but highly productive, like the Nicolet, the Harps, the, the, the Canisteos, the Colo, all the things, see, this test is much better. Now, there are two, three labs that do it. The removal for maintenance, pay attention to that. We do not recommend the yield for the low testing classes because the rates that we recommend are to get maximum yield, not to get maximum economic yield. Because we believe that you cannot afford to have low testing soils. But for the maintenance, look at the yield impact in the removal. And if you are making corn silage or you are baling corn stalks, Watch the potassium. The, the phosphorus changing from grain to silage or stover removal uh, get, increases by about one third. But potassium can be two to three times larger. That's why in, in many manure fields we see potassium deficiencies. Be careful with potassium. Okay, and this is the net returns. And uh, when I use here well, three scenarios, great prices about what we have today in the center and then very bad prices. See, these are net returns. And these are the interpretation classes, corn and soybean. See, organic or not, you cannot afford to be in the low classes. You have to do something. As I said, I know that you have a philosophy of farming which is different. There are other values that you consider, you see, that, but you need to make a profit. And if you are too high, you are applying too much. Uh, this is uh, phosphorus. This is potassium by the moist test in the top, by the dry test in the bottom. You need to look at that. Okay, I have just two, three, four slides. How much time I have? Oh, I'm doing great. Okay. Yeah, I didn't tell you to ask questions because I know that they want the questions, you know, uh, at the end. But, um, okay, I'm not going to talk about nitrogen and water quality. I, I, I'm not a researcher with that, and there is all kind of information out there. Uh, the nutrient center, the, the, the NRCS, the NR, there are all kinds of things that you talk about the nitrogen. And the key issue for organic matter, for organic farmers or not, is don't load those soils with nitrogen that is not needed. That, that's essentially the case. And of course, the most important thing is the nitrate loss with, with tile drainers, also surface drainer. Okay, but phosphorus, I, half of my project over the last 12 years have been in phosphorus and water quality. So I need to talk a bit about that. I think it's important. Uh, here I, ha I have the, on, on the left, I borrowed this from somebody, I don't remember who. What are the pathways for phosphorus to go into a lake, streams, or whatever, you know? And this is important because the, the soil test phosphorus and the application rate is only one of many factors that determine. If you put lots of phosphorus in a field and that phosphorus doesn't go anywhere, what's the problem? Okay? But if the phosphorus goes somewhere, 
uh, which the most important thing in Iowa is erosion, you know, and sloping ground. Then we have a problem. So then the P index is not a magic tool. When we developed P index 10, 12 years ago, I mean, uh, some people say, oh, this is a new tool. Yeah, it's new, but the concept, we have known that for 50 years. It's just that we put that in a, in, a, in a risk assessment tool that farmers can use, required or not, I suggest, look at the P index. It is, it is important. If you care about sustainability of the soil and water quality, you have to run the P index, required or not. It is very useful, okay? These are the, the factors that we have in the P index. You can look at the printed version, you can look at the calculator that NRCS has, you know. And the size of the, these pictures here on the right is an idea of what's, in, in general, in Iowa, what's the most important pathway, which is erosion, then comes surface runoff, and far down is with tide drainage. Yeah, if you have a 0% slope a field, then you can have a lot, most of the fossils can be lost with tile drainers, but that is very small compared with what you get with losses with runoff, even in flat land because you have all these inlets, you know, that the, the, the phosphorus goes there. Now, I know I'm telling you to read all kinds of things, okay, but don't just be happy with the P-index results, look at the outputs of the calculator. You see, this is one example. The, the components for the erosion losses, this is particulate P, or sediment bound P. The runoff, the loss with the surface drainage. By looking at these numbers, you can see what is the major, pro if, I mean, if you are in the high, See, what is the major problem? What should you do? Should you change the, the stop applying P? Or should you go to no till? Or you should put some buffer strips? Or you could this or that, you see? This is the beauty of the P in this. It's not perfect. I, I coined with uh, Jim Baker many years ago. It's directionally correct. It's not a full model. There is no good full model for fossil loss no matter what some people say. But it is important, but more than that, I remember we worked, you know, with Barb Stewart many years ago. Somebody remembers Barb Stewart in, in RCS? Are you in RCS? Jeez, you're wrong. <laughs> you should remember. Okay, see, we can uh, use the, the P in this for an entire field, for the most erosive part, or you can use it for different uh, parts of the field, what an RCS is called CMU, chromatization units, you know. And, and you know, in, 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 with many fields, if you care about phosphorus and the environment, unless you run the pinders for different parts of the field, depending on the slope, this and that, you may not apply the manure at all there. It is in your advantage to look into this. And we've done it. We work with several farming a demonstration project, I mean, that we can do it. We can have two, three, four zones in fields. So then in one part, you may not be able to apply any manure because the phosphorus is too high. In the other, you can apply, you know, end base. You see, I know it's complicated. And if you have, you know, a 80 acre field, maybe it's not worth it. But if you have a larger field, like most fields, organic or not, are getting larger in Iowa, you need to use this concept. We cannot be managing a field for the average. We, you guys cannot afford to do this anymore. We need to do something else. Uh, of course, erosion is an important thing. This comes from uh, applying the index. You see, if you have, you see, the, the normal erosion in, with four, five, six percent slope, and uh, you have, you know, 15 tons, you know, loss of that, you can stop applying P. Who cares? There will still be phosphorus coming out of the field. See, that's the beauty of the P index. It's not perfect, but 
it tells you what the heck, if, if, the, if the pain is high and the risk is high, what you can do to reduce that. It's not just stop applying manure. There are many things that you can do. Uh, and we have the data. Of course, we know that no-till, you know, reduces soil loss and also reduces total fossil loss. This is an experiment, you know, that we uh, had in Northwest Iowa six years, you know, with fertilizer management or, or injected soil manure, pea base. You see? Now, what happened is with the no-till is great because you reduce the, fo the total fossil loss, but you may increase the proportion of dissolved pea. Lots of people are, 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 are worried about that now, especially what's going on in the Lake Erie, on Ontario, Ohio, things like that. You see, uh, you need to be careful. You need to look at the total pea, but also the dissolved pea. And, and, and the management practices that you can implement to reduce one or the other may not be the same ones. You may need a combination. I know it's not easy, but you need to look into that. This is work that we did, I don't know, many years ago with Master Hack and others. We worked in uh, several fields. I don't remember how many. I think there were 20 plus. I thought I had put that in there. See, we have no pea, beef cattle manure, poultry manure, liquid soil manure, and fertilizer, or all applied 100 pounds, P205, okay? And then we rain within 24 hours, okay? We created that. We were with this construction all over Iowa, you know, with the rainfall simulate. So you see, uh, if, you, if you have solid manure, I mean, you have much less losses immediately after the application to the surface than with liquid soil manure or fertilize. Now, in the P index, we don't have that. We discussed that with Kevin and others a long time, you see, because this may be important. When we developed the pin, that we didn't have this information. Now I have lots of data. So maybe in the new um, revision of the pin, this, you know, maybe we can include some of that. But you see, this is the, the catastrophic losses. You see, you should not apply manure to the surface if you know that you have a high probability of rain in the next two, three days. If the rain comes, you know, a week or two later, the losses goes down mm, dramatically. And with solid manure, there is almost no phosphorus losses. For a variety of reasons, I have the data. I don't have time to show you that. But consider this. Okay, uh, cover crops. <laughs> A few years ago, the wind coming from the southwest, from Kansas, was saying that, yeah, cover crops are great for nitrogen, um, reducing nitrogen loss, and are great for reducing soil loss, but, but for phosphorus, they, they can increase, actually, the, the loss. Okay, so we got a great funding from the Iowa uh, Nutrient Center. We work six years in a field, and these are the averages. We do have the cover crops do reduce soil and phosphorus loss. But the, you need to look at the proportion, these numbers is the proportion of the phosphorus that is the salt pea. So this is no till, this is no till with cover crops, this is tillage, chisel plow, and this is still with cover crop. You see, the, the, the proportion is a bit higher of the, of the dissolved pea, but there is still a net reduction. So we can use cover crops. Cover crops are not magic, okay? See, here in the ivory tower, you know, some people believe, ah, oh, cover crops will solve all the problems, you know, in, in production. They will not, especially because they will not increase yields. I mean, they may, you know, you know how many years. But they are good because of this. The Matt Helmers and company, a lot of people have these uh, uh, experiments in the Neil Smith uh, refuge, looking at uh, prairie strips. So uh, I work with them, with my assistant side, Dr. Hack, in two years. So we look at, at the effects of soil loss, 
in 2013 and 2014 for the row crop, no-till, and with or without the strips. And then we look at the runoff phosphorus concentration. Total is the, the gray and black is the dissolved P. So you see, with the, uh, uh, in, in one year, there was essentially zero dissolved P loss, but in the other year, the, 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 the proportion of the runoff that was dissolved P increased. Okay, so yeah, we need to consider that. See, we know till, yeah, it's great, but we can reduce total loss of phosphorus, but we can reduce soil loss, but we may increase the soil phosphorus loss. We need to watch for that. Okay, uh, I know this was a heavy weight, you know, lots of data and information, but I. I did what I could, Kathleen. Hopefully this is uh, useful. Uh, you know where I am. You can send me an email. Our soil fertility website is very useful. You, should, you can go take a look. We have all these menus for manure, for this, for that. And we have all kinds of publications and articles there. So with that, if there is time for a question, great. If not, I will be here for the questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Antonio. You can see how much work he's done to improve um, nutrient management in Iowa. Um, just two housekeeping notes. Please feel free to use the restrooms anytime you need. They are out the door and to the left. Um, we don't have time for a set break um, because we're going to move on to Kevin's presentation and then have some openings or discussion period after that and we do have recycling bins out front if you um, are done with your water bottles they can be recycled out front so now I have to find Kevin's other one which is called erosion prediction and nutrient budgeting so let's see if that works here we go back to Kevin which is kind of tough I thought we'd get a little bit of a break but I guess you're letting us get out So I will uh, talk a little bit about erosion prediction, nutrient budgeting, uh, maybe just compliment a little bit of what Antonio was saying and just a few of the things that we're looking at when we look at uh, organic systems. Um, so we do our soil loss, we do it with Russell, and, um, and when we predict, that's our erosion prediction tool, we're looking at the soil type you have there. We're looking at the slope length, slope steepness of that soil. What county you're in has to do rainfall factors. We're looking at the yields. Um, we do go to our field office technical guide and we have yields that are tied to those soil types. And that's what we use when we're doing these calculations. And then on the next ones are really what the farmer brings into it. Uh, the crop rotation, what's being used out there. Um, and we're looking at it for all the management activities, every soil disruption activity. So we're looking at the tillage operations, we're looking at the planter paths, row cultivations, rotary hoeing. Um, all those go in to figure in soil loss. We're looking at the row grade out there on those. Uh, are we using cover crops? Um, all those things go in for, um, for predicting a soil loss. And I'll show you a couple of predictions. We came up for a few, a few uh, systems. But uh, um, so the ways we look at reducing erosion in an organic system, um, heard Kathleen talk a little bit about the no-till soybeans and crimp cereal rye. Um, I could go into a little detail of what it takes to make that work, but I think we've got some farmer producers that are doing it, and it's really better to hear it from them. Um, cover crops can play a role, um, but it's somewhat limited when it's after a full season corn or beans. And uh, when we can get the biggest bang is when we've got a small grain in that system. So now we've got a, the small grain itself helps to reduce erosion, 
because we're getting that uh, small grain established in the spring. And so we've got that cover sooner for those spring rains. And then we're getting that small grain or wheat harvested so that now in the summer that allows us to come in with a cover crop that um, you know we can have planted by August 1st so we can get a lot more biomass. So that system gives us a lot of benefits maybe from just nitrogen, but a lot of benefits from the soil erosion standpoint. Of course, we love uh, perennial hay, alfalfa, uh, in organic systems because that certainly helps us reduce erosion, not just the time period that that alfalfa is sitting there, but once we leave alfalfa and we go into corn, um, that alfalfa has given us a lot of soil structure, a lot of the roots in that soil, so we get some benefits in the next few years following that alfalfa. Um, contouring, it's not something we talk about much as an agency as we used to, um, but we can get more credits in organic systems than we can conventional. And the reason for that is when we do row cultivation and we're leaving ridge heights out there, so if we're on the contour with those ridge heights, that can help, that'll help us uh, on, on our soil loss equation. So I, I, there's a lot of different uh, factors that go in, but I went ahead and just did some for the clarion, uh, B, C, and D slopes. And I could have changed my title up there. Um, so the clarion B, 4% slope, C slope is a 7% slope used. And then on the end there, 138D2 is a 12% slope. What you don't see there is a slope link tied to those. So in our clarion in Story County, we're only using 98 feet, which is a pretty short slope length. Now, it's not as a big a factor as the slope percent, but I went ahead and threw in 371, which is at Sharpsburg, Naira in uh, Cass County. So clarion's a till soil, Sharpsburg, Naira. We're getting into a lust soil, so that soil type is more erosive. And then the slope length for that is 200 feet and not 98. So I thought, and so we deal with a corn bean system. We're on that B slope. And this is with heavy tillage on both sides. And I put in three rotary hoes and three row cultivations. And so the flatter soils, we're at 2.7. So we're under the five tons. We jump up to the Clarion C. We still stayed you know, right at that tolerable soil loss level. And once we go over to the Cass County for that C slope, with the longer slope lengths and a lost soil, it jumps up considerably. So, you know, obviously with soil erosion, it does matter on these soil types and where you're at. And then we jump up to a D slope, which is, you know, always gonna be tough. It's gonna be a struggle to intensively farm a D slope, you know, corn, bean with tillage. And so that will come up with 12 tons of soil loss. Um, we bring a small grain into the system. You can see we drop, drop our soil loss down. So now on that uh, Sharpsburg Naira, we're, we're just under the five tons. So that's beneficial. And what I didn't have in here, if we're gonna go to a corn bean oat system, you know, we really love to see a cover crop coming in right after that. And so that's gonna help us out additionally. Um, I changed up a little bit. I went corn, bean, wheat, um, and two years of alfalfa. So with the corn, bean, wheat, um, that wheat was, was planted in the, uh, after the soybeans and then going to two years. And so you can see with that system, now we're dropping that soil loss down. We're still not there with that D slope. And, and that's with the shorter length slopes. So if that was a lust soil and longer length slopes, it's gonna be greater than that. So what we have to do is, you know, look at additional hay. 
and try, in trying to bring that down, we could throw in some no-till beans in there. But it just becomes more difficult on these steeper slopes when we think about organic production on a field scale level. Um, is there any, well, I, may, I guess we'll wait on questions. Um, when we look at the nutrient side of it, we heard a lot from Antonio and he covered this real well. So that 590 nutrient management guidance documents takes a lot of those Iowa State publications and kind of puts them in one place. So we, we try to summarize the key things on soil testing and we give you that, that uh, publication number to go to get more information. Um, I uh, put in P and K application, we follow Iowa State's recommendations on the commercial side. And so that optimum, we're putting on a removal rate. High and very high, we're not putting on. And so those are the Iowa State's recommendations agronomically. And, but when we deal with manure, we are allowed to go over those agronomic rates for P and K. We can't go over the agronomic rate for the nitrogen, but we can for the P and K, but that's where Antonio brought, talked about it, that P index, that assessment tool that we're using, um, which can allow us to go over, over that removal rate. Now, our P index, um, it has five assessment levels. So when we're in the low, very low or low, we can, we, we can put on the nitrogen rate, we can't, not to exceed the um, 182 pounds for the main part of Iowa. Um, and, and regardless of what the P level is. But once we hit that medium assessment level, we can't go over that crop removal rate. So as an organic producer, it's important, you know, to keep those assessments low. Um, otherwise, you could be buttoned up against how much manure you can put on due to phosphorus, that phosphorus risk assessment. Because um, once we hit high and very high on the assessment, there's we, no manure allowed to meet our standard unless we bring in practices that reduce that assessment level. Now, that's what it takes to meet our, our NRCS 590. Now, Iowa State law also has those requirements, um, but for not all manure. So, the manure man where, when a manure management plan is required, that P index is to be ran. And there is one caveat that we changed because nationally, when we updated our nutrient management standard, nationally they changed that medium assessment. We used to say two times removal rate. So nationally they went to one, just removal. So we went to one in Iowa. So Iowa DNR hasn't done that yet. So there is a little bit of difference between us and DNR in that case. So if you're an organic producer and you're using poultry manure, the law deals with that a little differently. So you, they don't have to run that P index. But as an organic producer, you know, poultry's loaded with, with P, and you bring that up, you might be okay with the state law, but eventually we all, you're gonna run the risk potentially. Does that change in our state law? You know, state law doesn't always make sense, you know. Does it make sense that we have to do a P index for swine manure and liquid cattle manure and not poultry? So it could change. Or, and we could be looking at, we haven't updated the P index factors for a long time. Um, I think Antonio wants to retire before we do that. But, uh, um, but anyways, when, we, when that gets updated, it's, it's going to move the needle a little bit in the more conservative figure. Or, you know, um, Antonio talked about, you know, the P and the losses we have. I think I've seen the studies show like 80% of our phosphorus losses 
is in the soil erosion, or what we call particulate P. And 20% is insoluble P. But we used to not think we had much soluble P unless we were in triple digit phosphorus levels. And now Antonio will say, once we hit the very high test on a soil, 35 parts per million, that we start to see some soluble P. So, you know, just good management, I think, long term, whether you're following our standard or not, is to be aware of those, those P soil test levels and how this assessment uh, tool looks on your farm. Um, and we covered that sensitive areas when we're using the manure. And a lot of times with organic production, we are incorporating that manure to, take, to get that full in. Um, but we still like to see a filter strip in place. But as long as it's incorporated or injected within 24 hours, you're good. Otherwise, we need a grass filter strip for 50 feet or a 200 foot setback. Um, Antonio talked about the corn nitrogen calculator. And I think as an organic producer, I think, you know, what I like to look at in this case, I don't think you guys are, are a lot of times looking to maximum the nitrogen. And you look at that top of that curve on, on there up in the upper right and how that flattens off, and Antonio spoke about it. It could have a 30-pound difference in nitrogen and only affect your bottom line by a dollar. So when you're looking at the manure, as long as you're confident of the manure test and the variability, you know, uh, so to keep that phosphorus somewhat limited, you know, you don't want to get on that over-applying nitrogen. You may want to bring that down some. So when we think about uh, organic, um, I think when we were kind of training some of our planters as we're looking at this new standard and looking at organic and manure, I probably failed here to talk about the nutrient budget like we should have. So when we deal with an organic system, we need to know that rotation. And then it, very quickly we can determine how much we're, and we we'll know the yields that we expect. And very quickly we're going to be able to determine how much P and K we need in that rotation. So we get a handle on that. Then um, we need to look at where our corn is, what, what crop are we following, and get a handle on how much nitrogen do we want to have in place. Um, and then once we have that, then we're gonna look at the manure resources we have available to us. So are we dealing with liquid cattle? Are we dealing with solid cattle? Are we dealing with poultry? Are we dealing with swine manure? And we wanna look at that manure sources we have, and we wanna look at the tests that are coming out of those sources. So if you're an organic producer and you're using, uh, and you're buying swine, manure by state law they're they're testing that manure every year so you they'll have those numbers and they'll actually have the numbers before the application takes place because it seems to be the industry standard now is to go in ahead of time in a pit before it's agitated and they'll take a sample on the towards the bottom one in the middle and one towards the top and, and so they have those numbers before the applicators actually run. And the nice thing about some of this technology is really changing in, in the favor of good manure management. So when we deal with liquid applicators, those guys come out, a lot of times they're custom, um, and the manure's tested, and they got controllers on that manure applicator so they can dial right in to the gallons. Now, typically, they're going to dial right in to the maximum gallons allowed by Iowa DNR, which is different than the maximum nitrogen that we allow in our standard. So we go by Iowa State in that core nitrogen calculator. Iowa DNR goes by an earlier versions of Iowa State's recommendation where they looked at yield goal. 
So what that generally means is they can put on a higher rate than we can for our standard. But so we can do a lot better job of getting on that on a, on a consistent rate. Now, if I'm an organic producer and I'm gonna get my manure from a certain outfit, I'm gonna be talking to the manager of that and I'm gonna make sure they know, hey, this is my in-source, I need that agitated. I mean, agitated well. Because if it is agitated well, that nitrogen will stay in, you know, it'll come out pretty, pretty nicely. Um, so, and then when we deal with manure in general, um, we have, uh, well, we talked about book values and the standard requires test of any manure and you wanna do that regardless. But then we also talk about what we have to test in that manure. And the one thing which is not required in our nutrient standard, but that we recommend is testing for ammonium. Because and, and the, the organic fraction of that manure. So the benefit there is that ammonium is available. So in the publication that Iowa State has, I think it's 1003, and it talks about that availability factor. It's got cattle in their liquid. You know, and I think it says up to 50%. Well, if that test comes back and you got 60% ammonium, you're gonna take that credit because it's there, that organic portion, or excuse me, the inorganic portion. And then the, it's the organic one that gives us fits. So from a soil health perspective, we love that organic in. You know, the guys that are using cattle manure solids in poultry and stuff, that's a really be it's a nice benefit for organic matter and soil health. But it gives us fits in as far as um, what can we take credit for on that organic portion. And that and that and that takes uh, that's a little hard for us to um, estimate. Um, I think when we're using organic sources and you've been in that system for a long time, then eventually that soil equilibrium starts to build up and it starts, I believe, to kick us out a little more consistent in. But, um, so the other thing, we have this uh, inorganic and organic in, so we gotta figure the availability and then we gotta look at volatization factors. And Antonio talked about that. So for injecting the manure, we're not worried about it. Incorporating the same day, I think the, when you look at the publication, it'll be around 95% that we can take credit for because we're getting it incorporated. But when we leave it out on the surface, those volatization rates go up. So that's another factor that we have to deal with when we deal with manure. So getting back to that nutrient budget a little bit, um, the PM 1688 is the kind of the Bible publication that Antonio has. And so definitely look at that a lot. And that top right, it's just what the removal crop removal rates are based on yield. So to do a nutrient budget on the bottom, um, just has the different crops that might be in the rotation. You put in the, the year you're gonna have, is it gonna be one year of corn, two years of corn, two years of alfalfa, four years of alfalfa, and put that in, and then you know that total P and K that you're expected to remove in that system. And now, then, like I said, we gotta look at those nutrient sources. And then we're gonna figure what we're getting out of those nutrient sources. And this is a challenge with manure and organic. It's trying to get that stuff to balance. And so it's one thing we can get, make sure we get the in, but if we have high P sources, we're really gonna put a lot of P in that soil. Or the other thing is, Antonio mentioned, it's just as critical we get alfalfa in the system. We wanna make sure we got enough potassium in there. So, you know, different rotations kind of gives you an idea of our, our total P and K needs there. And I think we really need to do this as we get into the 823 standard for every, for every system. 
Um, so we get just, get, we're going to do the P index. That's going to guide you on what it takes to meet our standard. But that nutrient budget will give you an idea of where you're headed. And because if you don't know that, we could reach that wall where you can't apply additional manure. But, um, I went ahead and, and just looking at what is available. Well, let's say we use swine manure and I'm shooting for 150 pounds of in. And um, so using book values, that would give me 140 pounds of K and 100 pounds of potassium. Now, I think those book values are in the systems that don't feed with phytase, because I think once we use phytase, that's a supplement they use um, for feeding hogs that makes them the, the feed more efficient. They don't have to put as much phosphorus in the supplement. So that's going to be closer probably to 100. But it, it varies, and that's why we do the manure test, that we just got to know. Um, with cattle, uh, feeder, solids, if we need 150 pounds of uh, N, we end up with 158 pounds of P, 316K, which if I got alfalfa in my system, having that uh, cattle manure available would be great. And, and then with the poultry, uh, we put on enough for 150 pounds of N, I got 390 pounds of P. Okay. That's enough for typically eight years of corn bean crop removal. So poultry's great. I love the stuff. Sells for a lot of money, but we got to be careful with it in the organic world. Um, And when you jump back to that P index, and Antonio covered this pretty well, you know, we're just looking at those different factors. So, you know, one of the big things you control is the, the soil parts per million, and, and that, uh, for phosphorus, that's a big one. And um, it is tied pretty heavily to soil erosion because that, when we lose, phosphorus ties up with the soil. So when we have soil loss, we're, we're moving um, the soil P. But we do also have that soluble P factor. So it accounts for that. But some of the things we can do, obviously we want to keep the soil loss to a minimum, but also that um, assessment takes into account um, where we can catch sediment. So whether it's level, we got terraced out the field or we got filter strips, that helps us to keep that assessment number lower. Um, this is just what it looks like, our 590 Nutrient Management Guide document. And I brought that up before, but um, I, it's not going to replace Iowa State's publications, but we take the, the, the best goody out of those publications that we need the most. And like I said, every time then we have that publication in there, so you can go to that publication for more information. Um, and then my last slide here, uh, just things to keep in mind. When you think about our nutrient needs in organic, you know, manure is not our only in source. So we need nitrogen for that corn. We can bring that in with lagoons, and especially three years of alfalfa. As Antonio said, Iowa State says zero to 30 pounds of N following a three-year stand of alfalfa, which can be up to 50% grass. And the Iowa State, I don't think I'm reaching out to say is going to be always a little conservative because they don't want producers to be short. So if I'm organic, I'm feeling pretty good about corn after alfalfa. Um, but that alfalfa requires lots of potassium. So it was just as much as we don't want to see the phosphorus levels get too high, we want to make sure we got the potassium needed to get that good production. We can put manure on top of an alfalfa stand. 
and know that that nitrogen component of that, that legumes are going to take that up. So when we use soybean, any legume, they're, they're going to take the lazy way out. You give that legume plant nitrogen, and they're going to scavenge it. So we're okay with that. It'll scavenge that up. And then, then uh, you'll have what the P and K needed for the alfalfa plant. And I talked about the short and long-term goals of uh, phosphorus management and potassium. And I've mentioned some about the technology of like the liquid applicators today, um, to be able to use those controllers. Um, now with a solid manure, we have the vertical beater bars, which do a great job of spreading that manure out evenly across the field. And now today, a lot of these manure spreaders have scales on them. So they can actually get that scale, that monitor, that feed, that manure coming out. So they're a lot more accurate on how much they're putting out. So I talked to one of our planters who, who does quite a bit of farming, and he bought one of these new uh, spreaders with the scales. And with his cattle manure, he ended up um, spreading on 140 additional acres because of the accuracy of, of that spreader. So I, I think that some of this technology is really nice when it comes to manure. But with that, I'm turn it back. Thanks, Kevin, for providing some practical examples. And um, we're, lunch is here, but we're going to take 20 minutes of burning questions from the audience. And are there any in the chat box, too? Um, Josiah, can you go check with Roger to see what's in the chat box from the Zoom attendees? And um, for those of you that are transitioning, I just wanted to review that in order to be certified organic with the National Organic Program, the re only requirement for soil quality, your soil health, is that you do follow a rotation and you use all natural ingredients for your fertilization. Um, if they see erosion on your property or they see that you're over applying manure, they will definitely not certify you. But what we're talking about with NRCS is the next level, i.e. getting paid for these practices that help improve soil quality. So when you hear from the organic farmers today, two of them have not enlisted in NRCS programs to date. Maybe today will change their mind, but one has. So I also want to, I also asked them to touch on that, you know, why they went into um, their NRCS office and signed up for programs as opposed to not. And um, I can see the issues, you know, it, it definitely looks complicated, but, the first step, I think, is meeting with your NRCS folks and sitting down with their um, conservationists and planners and having, you walk, having them walk you through it. They're very, very helpful. And we'll talk about that later, too, with a real example we have from the layman farm. So with that, are there questions in the chat box? No? OK, good. That makes it easy. <laughs> OK, so questions. We're just going to take 20 minutes questions for um, Antonio or Kevin, or is it all a blur? Ron, and um, there's a microphone we'll pass around. Uh, thank Maybe you. Maybe if you say who you are, too. Uh, Ron Roseman. Uh, Antonio, with your manure types, if it's dry beef manure, there's, you're not figuring any uh, straw or carbon in there, correct? And then maybe also, I see there's no dry hog manure, so we don't have any. Yeah, we have that in the in that BMR one zero zero three. See, we have some some values there of availability, and um, the the most important thing is that in in solid manures, you know, we have that carbon there, and we have the straw, all these things. Okay. Uh, how how that is measured when people sample, you see, and then the analysis, that's a different story. But uh, 
Yes, that's, that's considered. And that's why you see liquid soy manure is essential. There is little carbon there. That's why the ammonia, the ammonium could be 70, 90%. But uh, yeah, with the solid manures, you know, we do have all this that I didn't talk about it. Uh, we are applying more carbon, so we are hopefully improving physical properties and things like that, more than with the liquid sources. Uh, see, I'm not sure if I answered your question. But yes, that, you did. Yeah, but that, that brings also more uncertainty in, in terms of the actual supply once it is applied you know, for the solid manures. Is that the issue? Is the problem of the uniformity of applications? So it's complicated. <laughs> and that will lead into our after lunch speaker, um, Sabrina Roos, who will be talking about carbon. Paul. Okay, um, Paul Muggy. Follow up to, to Ron's question, Antonio. How much difference does it make if you're composting that raw manure? Okay, <laughs> I should send that to Kathleen, you know. Uh, I, I have not worked with, with compost, but the, the main issue with the compost is the nitrogen availability. See, because much of that uh, nitrogen can be volatilized, you know, with, with the process of composting. Now, in terms of the phosphorus and the potassium, that that's no problem, you know. Whatever the analysis tells you, that's that's what it is. So there is no changes really that can affect much in the fossil potassium, unless that is the potassium leaching. This is something that you need to be careful. I mean, I remember since remember Dick Thompson, you know. Okay, so the potassium leaching, you know, from piles, you know, from from uh, outdoor, you know, storage, you know, it can be important. Kapil, did you have anything to add on that? Kapil Aurora. Kapil Aurora, I'm a field engineer with the Iowa State University Extension, have worked with composting quite a bit. Uh, during composting, the temperatures go really up, and that alone is a good driver for ammonia to volatilize. So if you have raw manures with high ammonia going into composting, you will lose significant amounts of nitrogen to the point that 100% uh, of that ammonia nitrogen may volatilize during the entire process. Uh, so on cattle manures with a lot of carbon already in it, uh, you'll not lose as much because you have more organic fractions to start out with. But liquid swine manures that have high ammonia in them, uh, you, you will volatilize quite a bit of it. Bottom line, test and test again, eh, Antonio? <laughs> Other questions before lunch? And we'll have a lot of time after the talks, too. Oh, did you have a question, Kapil? I, I do have a question for Kevin. Uh, with your 590 standard uh, for the medium risk category, uh, what is the reasoning to go to just 1x uh, removal rate for phosphorus? Any, anything there you want to share? That. Hold up, Kevin. <laughs> the reason we went to 1X was strictly um, the national standard. So what we try to do with our 590 standard is, you know, we're following Iowa State's recommendations, and we're following Iowa state law, but we also have to follow the national 590 standard that we're given, and then we can then um, uh, change that national standard to make it more restrictive, but not less. So because the national standard went to that one maintenance at medium assessment, we had to do that. And, and that would be for both organic and uh, inorganic farming practices as well, right? It yeah. would apply uniformly across. Yeah, so, uh, you know, normally in the past, we've never ran the P-index on commercial fertilizer. And we are asking, the national standard kind of had that in there, and so now we're asking planters to go ahead and run that for commercial. But in the past, it always been it's just for manure, and that's really the critical thing is for us is on manure. Because, you know, if, if you're not put, our standard says not to put on P and K once you get above optimum. So there's nothing you're gonna do. If that P index is high, because you've got excessive soil parts per million, and now they're gonna follow our standard, 
well, you're just not going to put it on, and that's about, you know. So, so the change would be for that medium category where the P index is between two and less than five. Yep. Yep. And, and there's there's quite a few producers in the state with that board. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that Iowa DNR will follow along. All right, thank you. All right, we had another question back here. And if you could say your name and where you're um, from, please. Brett Buckholtz, um, just outside of Ames here. Uh, maybe I missed it because I had to step out quick, but is there concern with latent herbicides and pesticides in manure from uh, the hay that livestock have consumed? Kapil, could you answer that one? No. <laughs> um, I know it is a concern nationally. Yeah. Um, there uh, was like an specifically issue. Specifically graze on. Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, anecdotal stuff of people's gardens pretty much being ruined because they've exactly. put in, uh, even composted manure on it and um, haven't been able to grow anything for years. So Exactly. It was a huge problem out in Washington State uh, more on probably like five years ago. So... Um, in Europe, you are only allowed to use manure from organic farms because of that issue. We don't have that rule here because we don't have enough manure. Sure. I'm and glad to hear Iowa has the most manure in the nation. I never knew that, Kevin. <laughs> and then uh, as a follow-up, is there a place, uh, is there a list of uh, places that we could get organic manure from or? Roz, do you guys have a list of manure sources? Okay. That's a good idea, though. Maybe we could work on that. Um, I know most organic guys that have their own source of manure, they probably pretty much have enough for themselves. Hey, Ron, would you ever be able to sell any? Or no, he's saying no. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that definitely is a constraint if you... But you have cattle, right, Brett? I was thinking for my garden. Oh, okay. My cattle are in my pasture, and fertilizing my pasture, but um, for my garden and other people I know that, that garden and want organic man composted manure. It's been uh, kind of scary trying to get some from different farmers around the area. I know. I, th I think that would be a good business for somebody to get into. Ron has got something to say. If you hold for the microphone, because the Zoom people need to hear you through the line here, sorry. I'm going to speak a little bit about this in my presentation, but I'll just say it now. It, what it speaks to is we need, in organics, more opportunities to raise organic livestock, but that becomes a marketing issue because there are so many forces out there uh, with uh, labeling, even though organic is still the gold standard but consumers are very confused and, and it, I mean, it gets complicated. Uh, so, but I'll speak a little bit to that later. Okay, great, thank you. Questions from Clint? Uh, I was just gonna comment, I'll take a very practical approach to your response on the pesticides. I'd go get a buck of the manure you're proposed to buy, get your most sensitive crop and throw some seeds in it. If they germinate, it's probably not infected and if they won't germinate, I might look elsewhere. So everybody hear that quick and dirty <laughs> example Clint put forward to do your own germination test with the compost you purchase. That's a good idea, Clint. And chances are if, if they germinate well and start to grow well, they're, it's probably pretty safe. You can also pay to get it tested for pesticide levels. It's expensive, but it can be done. Schaefer, are you Schaefer? Sorry. Okay, we'll get you next. Thank you. This room's kind of hard because you have to look back and forth. Um, so can you say your name and who you're with, please? Schaefer Ridgeway uh, with NRCS and Dr. Malarino. This question is for you. Um, nutrient stratification, especially with P, is a hot topic right now. May not be so much in the organic world because of tillage, but in the conventional world with with more people going to no-till, there seemed to be a concern about nutrient stratification. I think you mentioned that in your presentation, you talked about it. I personally think it's just a natural process, but how do we address, uh, because it is there, I think every test I've seen has been there, but then what? how do we address it? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's an issue. You see, one of the first things that I did when I started here as a professor, was to work in, uh, in, in that, in the certification, you know, for no-till, G-set blow, and so forth. 
And um, so the way I, 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 I did it in order to see if that's really a problem or not for, for crops is to see uh, what happened when we put the, the phosphorus deep below the, the, the surface, not just with like the two, three inches, but five, six inches deep. And uh, we did, I don't know, hundreds of, of trials on farm and, and the universities, and uh, that's not, for the phosphorus, it's, it's not a problem. You see, people are uh, out there exaggerating the, quote, problem of the stratification. And another thing that we have seen is that the there is certification also with chisel plow tillage. You know, we don't have the mold ball plow anymore. You know, so the soils are stratified everywhere, but uh, we could not see in in any of the hundreds of trials that really for phosphorus the deep banding improves that. So I think that um, people read too much. You know, some farm magazines. You know, from data from other states where. It's another planet, you know, with the different soils we have. We have these soils in Iowa that we have all this uh, rooting, you know, and then the, the no-till, you know. We have better um, efficiency for uptake of surface roots, you know. So, so it's not a problem. Now, for crop production, when we go for water quality, you see, the problem, as I show some some numbers, is mainly with the fertilizer and liquid soil manure broadcast on the surface. That's where we can have losses, you know, because if you have a, a, if if you apply the liquid manure broadcast and you apply the the fertilizers, you know, broadcast, then the probability of that being lost, you know, is really high. But also the um, extraction capacity of the rainfall is higher when you have that accumulation, you know, in the in the in the surface layer. But you see, we have so much so, so much advantages of the increasing organic matter, increasing infiltration, especially with no till and management. Um, it's not really a big deal, to tell you the truth. But. That's because we are in Iowa. You go to northern Missouri, some of those soils there. You go east, you know, and other places where uh, that you have these clay, clay soils, you know, heavy. Then we have a problem. I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, um, yeah, there is all kind of information. If you go to the soil fertility website, there is all kind of information. You know, you see that by debanding, we actually reduce that stratification, but and the crop doesn't care. Now, potassium is different. I mean, if you are with the old rich till, see, remember, guys, you know, we did several experiments with rich tillers. There is not much rich till anymore. That you need to put that potassium in the core of that ridge, you know. And uh, and in Western Iowa, when the droughts are more frequent, you know, we still suggest, you know, deep placement of the potassium in, 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 in no-till. I think we had somebody on this side. Was there a question over here? Yeah. Yeah. For Antonio. Oh. Um, when you're soil sampling, how long should you wait after your application of manure, of solid manure for reliability to take that into account? That's a great question. It doesn't, I, see, this morning, I worked until 2 a.m. last night because I was sick during the weekend, so I couldn't work in the presentation. And this morning at Seven, I think I, I cut like 10 slides, you know, and one of that, you see, um, we have worked with a fertilizer or manure, and the, the decrease, if you have a high testing soil, say 40 ppm, something like that, is, is, is on average about one to two ppm per year in consoluble rotation with grain harvest. So, if a, a farmer has, you know, uh, 30, 40, 50 ppm, uh, as I tell people, their children may retire before you need an atom of phosphorus there. Now, that's the problem. Now, we used to call that the residual effects of fertilizer or manure, you see, because you build up and then stay there for long. Now it's called legacy phosphorus. 
You see, they call it, if you listen to their legacy, that's what it is. You see, if you have these high levels, it may take forever, you know, to get that down. Unless you have, you know, do hay or silage or things like that, that you start, start removing. So this, this is a problem. If people believe it, you know, because say you switch to no till or you do this or that, you know, that you can reduce losses. Yes, you can, you know, but if you have those high levels, there will be losses for a long time. Okay. Unless we change to Brady, you know, and we send all the hogs and the cows to Arizona. But <laughs> did I answer your question? Well, I so let's say you're testing low and you put on your application of solid manure. Do you need to wait so long to see that bump in the analysis? No, we can. Uh, I mean, if you if you apply the rates that we recommend for low testing soils, uh, those are, uh, as I said, I think I said, those are not to attain maximum economic yield. We want to be sure that people apply the P and the K that they need. So if you do that, yes, you will build up really great. Now, we don't recommend build up for more than for two years. Now, of course, dealers out there, you know, if you have a low in soil, they want you to build up in one year or two and apply tons of phosphorus, you know, potassium there, but that's not economical. So, uh, yeah, you can monitor that. I mean. If you put the see manure one year, then you go in the fall and take the soil samples, I mean, you will see that P or K there. Yeah, you can. Uh, so am I, am I answering your question? So you're saying you'll see that analysis. Oh, yeah. You apply it this fall. Two weeks later, you go out and sample. You'll see the results. Well, you shouldn't do that because the variability is so high that, that I mean, if you put in the fall, uh, that's my question, is how long after you... Oh, okay. Uh, not for be, be before two, three months after the application. Yeah, because the variability is so, is so big. Yeah. Yeah, you need to be, be patient, you know, and apply, and, and they go next fall, you know, and do a sampling, you know. So that another thing that you can do is to do some tissue testing. I didn't mention that, but I think I have that that publication there in my presentation. So you can test tissue for P and K, you know, and that gives you an idea where you are. All right, thank you, Antonio. Any other questions before launch? Again, we're gonna have a full hour after the farmer's presentation to have discussion, so. Um, were there any online? No, but there was a, uh, someone had uh, typed in that sustain is an option for uh, organic poultry manure. So there is a commercial liquid fertilizer sustain. Well, it might come in dry and liquid um, that someone typed in that. Is anybody using that in the audience? So we'll have to follow up on that, Sabrina. <laughs> Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with the afternoon session to keep on schedule here. So we have uh, Sabrina Roos from USDA ARS speaking now, and then we'll have the farmer panel, and then we'll open it for full-on um, discussion. And hopefully Ben will, Layman will come up and show, talk a little bit about his A23 application too. So to start out, remember I said earlier, it's not just NP and K. Carbon also is critical in organic systems, driving the system, building up that organic matter, which is critical in organic regulations. So we'll have um, Dr. Sabrina Roos talk to us about that. She's a soil scientist at the USDA ARS National Lab for Ag and the Environment here in Ames, Iowa, and we're so excited that she's new and, well, she started in January, but still it's new to us, and she'll be working with us in our organic research projects. So. Dr. Roos, thank you. Oh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Kathleen has stated, I'm going to be talking about carbon and how we can manage that carbon in our agroecosystems. And so we're kind of linking this to soil health, but first we, we need to have a good idea of what soil health is. 
And the NRCS definition defines it as the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So that, that definition really um, encapsulates how soils are more than just a growing media for plants. And so this, this graphic that I have here with the soil, the plant, and the animal, and the human are meant to represent chain links. And if you break one of those chain links, you start to have problems down the line with the plant health, with animal health, or even with human health. So what is the link between carbon and soil health? Well, who can tell me what this brick is in this structure here? Keystone. Yes, it's a keystone. So that um, carbon forms that keystone for soil health. It's the catalyst for all of our soil properties and processes and really drives um, soil health. So we want to manage that carbon in a way that we can improve it and maintain it in our systems. How do we do that? Well, we can start following the principles of soil health, limiting disturbance, keeping the soil covered, including a diversity of plants and animals, keeping a living root in that soil year-round, and integrating animals. But before I dig into each of these aspects, we need to understand a little bit about the mechanisms of carbon storage. Now, I know this particular graphic is a little busy and has a lot of components to it. But if you focus on the top row, the physical entrapment, the physical chemical protection, chemical protection and biochemical stabilization, each of those are looking at different ways in which we store carbon. So we have the physical entrapment, so we're locking that organic matter up in a soil aggregate, protecting it from soil microbes. We have the physical chemical protection, which is just that attraction between the organic matter, the soil particles. You have chemical protection, which is the attraction between those different chemical components. And then your biochemical stabilization, which is just that recalcitrance of that organic matter. The, um, the harder it is to degrade, the less likely it is to, that the microbes will act upon it. So when we look at these different components and what we can manage, we need to look at what drives these different components. And for these three on the right, or your, yes, you're right, um, temperature, water, compatible reactants, so compatible um, uh, molecules and soil particles that are going to come together, soil particle surface area availability, and I'll come back to that in a little while, your organic matter or plant residue chemistry, and many others. Now when we look at the physical entrapment, it includes all of those factors that we just talked about, plus disturbance, and a lot of times when we talk about disturbance, we are talking about tillage. Now, one other thing we need to think about when we talk about the physical entrapment and soil aggregates, the fresh organic matter or carbon that we put into the soil is often within the macro aggregates, which are aggregates greater than 0.25 millimeters. They have a higher carbon concentration. But the key portion of this, and I have another graphic later that'll show this in a little more detail, is the microaggregates, which are smaller, but they are formed within the macroaggregates and contain more of that harder to degrade um, carbon and also better protected carbon. So when we look at these different mechanisms, what can we really manage to store carbon? Well, we can manage our soil aggregates to some extent and manage our chemistry. So when we look at, does the it does not show up, okay. Um, so when you're looking at this T1 um, up at the top, that is supposed to represent a macro aggregate that contains various pieces of particulate organic matter, or just that um, partially decomposed organic matter. And go moving down the T2 level, you'll notice that that black section there is meant to represent a new micro aggregate that is formed within that macro aggregate. Then under a no-tillage system, you continue to form microaggregates until you hit some kind of um, 
limiting factor that reduces microbial activity, that aggregate disintegrates, and the process starts all over again. Now, if going back to this T2 level, let's say you till, that breaks that aggregate, disrupts the formation of those microaggregates, and then the process has to start all over, but it's shortcutting the process and resulting in fewer microaggregates. So when we start to look at other mechanisms of carbon storage, I, I mentioned um, association with soil particles. This little graphic here is looking at the amount of silt and clay content and how that is related to the amount of soil carbon that's associated with that silt and clay. So as you increase in silt and clay, you increase the amount of carbon that is associated with that carbon pool. And then as we increase carbon, we also have increases in the amount of water-stable aggregates. So now we're going to dive into some of the soil health parameter or soil um, health practices and how they can work in organic systems and some ideas that we can use to manage our soil carbon. Well, in our organic systems and even in some of our conventional systems, tillage is often desirable for weed control, seed bed preparation. Sometimes that residue on the surface is a little intimidating for um, when you want to have a good stand of corn, soybean, whatever you're planting. Um, so we till it to make it a nice seed bed. Now, there's different levels of disturbance um, when we look at our di different tillage practices or tillage implements. Moldboard plow is the highest disturbance. It's the worst for um, soil carbon and soil health. Um, chisel plow is a little bit less intense. Then we're dropping back to disc, strip till, and some of the other conventional tillage practices, and finally, no-till. So when we look at um, these different tillage practices and their impact on soil carbon, this is a, uh, from a paper uh, that was done in Nebraska on a conventional corn soybean system, and I promise I will get to an organic system in a minute. But it, it's really nice because it has this gradient in tillage intensity. So um, if any of you have had statistics or have been exposed to statistics, um, you might know that the each column that has an A is the same, um, statistically speaking, and anything that has a different letter is different. Um, so if we look at the first one with the no-till disc and moldboard plow, moldboard plow decreased carbon compared to disc and no-till. If we look at the, um, the other one, the 39-year study, the no-till, the disc, and the chisel plow were actually similar in terms of carbon, but the the disc, chisel plow, and moldboard plow were also similar. But the key factor here is double disc, chisel plow may not be as bad when we look at carbon across the soil profile, at least not as bad as we would think it is, especially compared to moldboard plow. Now when we switch to an organic system, um, this is looking at tillage impact and system impacts in vegetables in North Carolina. It's just for that um, zero to 15 centimeter depth. And so we've got conventional tillage, organic tillage, conventional no-till, or organic no-till. They included a no-input um, tillage system and then just a grass um, uh, system. And here, well, so we start with that conventional till, has the, some of the lowest carbon that we're gonna see in the system. Organic tillage, mm, still similar to that conventional, Conventional no-till, that's better. Organic no-till, that's our A, that's our highest um, carbon level, and it actually matches the grass, which is really good. So we're moving in a, in a positive direction in our carbon by managing our tillage as much as we can. So when we talk about limiting um, disturbance in the organic systems, this graphic here is representing a no-till soil. We've got macroaggregates, microaggregates, the little black threads are meant to represent carbon, and then the little blue Pac-Man type figures are meant to represent our soil microbes. If we go through and employ some high intensity tillage, we break that all apart, and we um, reduce soil carbon, we reduce our macro and microaggregates, we increase organic matter availability, so we've just released a whole bunch of food 
for those microbes and increase their activity. We change their aggregate cycling, and we can increase carbon loss through erosion because the larger our aggregates, the less likely they are to be lost through water or wind erosion. So what are some strategies to limit our disturbance or reduce it in organic systems? Well, reduce and eliminate mold bore plow. I know that's it's less common than it used to be. Um, reduce tillage depth and frequency. So use strategic tillage or just areas that really need it. Occasional tillage is another option where you're just tilling every three years, every five years, um, and leaving your residues in the field, just leaving them there for the time being. So when we talk about um, impacts of organic systems on some soil health indicators, this is actually from the LTAR um, plots that Kathleen has been working on. And so we've got a conventional corn soy, conventional corn soy with an oat alfalfa, and then uh, the, other, the next system down has an extra year of alfalfa. And then the last system builds in an extra corn phase. And we do see numerical increases in our particulate organic carbon, our soil carbon, microbial car biomass carbon, MBC, does increase in our organic systems. And then phosphorus increases as well. Um, but overall, we do see improvements with those organic systems in our, some of our soil health indicators. Uh, the next um, component of the soil health practices, keeping the soil covered. When are soils most susceptible to erosion? Winter and? Spring, yes, both of them. Why? Well, we need to try and target keeping the soil covered at this time by delaying till it's just wait till spring if you can. Maintaining residue cover. Reduce the amount of residue you're baling if you're baling. Grazing your residues at an appropriate rate for the amount of residue that you have. Plant cover crops. Use perennials, at least in part of your system. And this, this practices, these practices improve soil carbon through reducing carbon losses through erosion and reduces raindrop impact to those soil aggregates. So if you bale off majority of your residues, come springtime, those raindrops have a lot of power behind them as they fall. They'll hit those soil aggregates and they actually cause them to disintegrate. Um, so by having those residues there, it acts as a buffer between the soil and the raindrop. In addition, the residues act like a blanket. They protect and moderate those free so freeze-thaw cycles and the wetting and drying cycles. So that also keeps those aggregates more stable and better protected. And these three photos here are some different things that um, people have done with cover crops. Um, the one is with a roller crimped rye cover crop that they've planted soybeans into. The bottom one um, is just standing rye that they planted the soybeans into and at the top, they actually harvested the rye uh, for its biomass to feed to animals or biofuel and then planted soybeans into that. Our next soil health uh, parameter is enhancing diversity in these organic systems. We have a lot of different plant species we can use and different groups of plant species we can use. Warm season species, cool season species, annuals, perennials, and within that, we have different groups. Our grasses, our legumes, our brassicas. Um, so selecting a, a crop sequence that really fits with what you're trying to do in your, in your um, organic system also helps build that diversity. And it also um, gives the microbes something different to eat. Imagine if you ate pizza every day. You'd get pretty bored eating pizza three times a day every day. So by giving the microbes something different, they, it changes your microbial um, components and allows them to try out something different. So what are some strategies to enhance diversity in organic systems? Well, you can have diversity in time by changing your, or having contrasting crop types in your rotation. 
Um, this is a corn soybean oat alfalfa 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 rotation. Um, but you can do, I have some other examples there of some different crop rotations that could be done. And cover crops count as part of that rotation and as part of that diversity. Another option is diversity in space. So use a cover crop mix. Um, use a species blend for your pasture or haylands that you're going to be putting in. Using prairie strips. Um, one of the photos here is from the, I borrowed from the ISU prairie strip study. Putting in a cover crop mix following winter wheat. And then also using grass waterways, grass hedges, riparian areas, that all enhances the diversity of the system as a whole. Next is Preventing a living root year-round in your organic systems. This is related to improving the diversity and keeping the soil covered, because both of those um, pieces ac can accomplish this. Roots are really, really important for soil carbon. They provide more carbon into the soil organic matter than the above ground tissues. In fact, 60 to 80% of the fresh organic carbon is from roots and 7 to 14% of carbon retained in mineral associated pools, so like associated with that carb, uh, clay and silt, is also from roots. Well, why is that? Because roots are in direct contact with the soil. They're right there interacting with those soil particles. And we also know that roots produce a lot of exudates um, and are shedding cells at different times in their, their lifespan. Uh, the next uh, piece is integrating animals. And there are a variety of ways we can integrate animals. We can have a pasture or forage phase. We can use some crop residue grazing. And that there are a number of uh, different calculators to calculate how much or how many head of animals you can use given the amount of residue that you have. You can also graze your cover crops. And with both of these grazing uh, the bottom two grazing options, just making sure that you're doing it at an appropriate time so that your soil isn't really wet. Because if your soil is wet, you're going to compact it with these animals walking around out there. And another piece with integrating animals is manure. Maybe you don't have the animals on your farm, but your neighbor might have manure that you could get. If you put on high rates of manure, you can see greater carbon um, changes. Cattle manure tends to increase um, carbon more than pig or poultry manure. And that's relative to either putting zero N on or a mineral N source. So when you, um, we look at the literature, in general, solid manures are better than composted manures, which are better than liquid manures. And why does this work? Well, you're stimulating microbial activity and increasing their biomass. You're interacting, uh, that organic matter is interacting with the soil surfaces. You're creating a lot more um, glues. The glue will start gluing those soil particles and that organic matter together. And thereby, you increase your aggregates and are increasing your storage. Now, one thing we've kind of hit on a couple of times today is phosphorus. Um, and it can be a problem with manures. And so incorporating um, the manure below the soil surface to prevent runoff losses, applying when runoff risks are low, planting high yielding forages or hay species are um, a way to reduce that phosphorus because you might be haying them off. You're going to take that above ground biomass off the system and thereby reduce some of the phosphorus. Incorporating legumes. You're going to be adding N, but not adding extra phosphorus. And then you can also start to look at um, choosing a Manure source that is a little bit better balanced in terms of the nutrients. Easier said than done, I know, because there's a lot of variability there. Um, but some of them do seem to be a little more just typical estimates. Um, and as we've said, others have said earlier, always test your manure. Um, but just typical estimates show that, yeah, some of these are a little more balanced or have a little more nitrogen than phosphorus. Now, OK, let's say you've been doing organic for a long time, but you've been including, 
but including tillage. What if you start stacking these practices together? What happens to soil carbon? Well, in theory, you can continue to incrementally increase your carbon levels. So this uh, graphic here is showing at the top here we have our native carbon. We plowed it, large decrease in carbon when doing conventional inputs and tillage, but little by little by stacking those practices, we could potentially enhance soil carbon more than doing just one practice alone. And then at the top, coming up with a next generation organic system, what does that look like? What does that entail that really harnesses um, the ability of an organic system to enhance carbon? Now, you're probably thinking, or might be thinking, well, I've been doing practice X for 15 years, and my organic matter has not changed. Well, there's some questions you got to ask yourself, because some of the literature shows that carbon doesn't always increase, but there's some reasons for that. How long have your practices been in place? What was your starting carbon or organic matter level? What was your soil texture? If you're using cover crops, are you getting enough biomass to put into that system? And I'm going to dive into each of these a little more detail here. So when you look at the amount of time and biomass, so in the lower left here, I have the amount of cover crop biomass on the bottom, and then on the Y, I have soil carbon. You have more cover crop biomass, you increase your carbon. But there's a magic, kind of a magic number when you start looking at the literature and start aggregating studies together. You need at least two megagrams per hectare of biomass to start showing changes in carbon. On top of that, you have duration of management. So you've been doing cover crops for two years or five years or longer than that. Well, you need to have, for a lot of these practices, you need time to start showing changes in carbon. And your low, soil carb low carbon soils are more likely to show changes in carbon than soils that are high in carbon. And why is that? Well, it's really kind of related to soil texture, but also the capacity of that soil to change. So when we look at the amount of clay and silt in the soil and the amount of carbon, we, we saw this graph earlier, you can think about it like, so, so clay and silt have surface area. They're going to interact with the carbon, but there's only so many places where they can interact. You can think of it like a bus. There's only so many seats on that bus before you run out of room. But you can theoretically start layering carbon on the surface and have layer one, layer two, just by interactions between the soil mole or the carbon molecules. But that pool can only really take so much because there's just so many places available. The other piece is, if you look at these glasses filling on the bottom, the one on the far left has the most capacity to take that water. Similar with the soil, it has the most capacity to change. But the one on the far right doesn't have that much room at the top. So you're going to add a little bit of carbon, but it's going to be much harder to detect than it is in the one on the left. Now, am I saying that carbon's going to totally saturate in your soil? No. Just certain pools may saturate in carbon, giving your, certain, your management techniques. So um, kind of concluding remarks. So carbon is linked to everything down the line, animal, human, environmental health. Carbon, manage it through chemistry, aggregates. Um, follow the soil um, health principles to manage that carbon, stacking practices. Now, that can help enhance carbon more than just that alone. And also remember, sometimes carbon's a little stubborn to change. Um, it can take time. You need sufficient biomass. And lower carbon soils maybe can respond more readily to management shifts. And with that, this is my last slide. Are we doing questions later? Um, we have time for some questions. Okay. Questions.
стою. You mentioned moldboard plow being the most aggressive patch or a pass. If it's replacing two disc passes, uh, would you prefer the two disc passes or the plow, you think? I would say two passes of the disc is less detrimental to soil carbon than the moldboard plow. Any other questions? Was there anything online? Nothing online. All right. Well, Sabrina will be here afterwards, so let's thank her. Thank you. Thanks, Sabrina. That was really helpful. So now, turning to the practical, more practical side, since we've had a lot of practical so far, but um, the farmers, and we're going to go in this order. We're going to have Paul Muggy first, and followed by... Ron Roseman and Scott Shriver, and then maybe we'll ask Ben to come up and say a few words about his application for the 823. Does that look like the first slide? No. Okay. Oh, it says slide four right there. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And Paul is a, an organic farmer in northwest Iowa around near Sutherland. He's been a great cooperator with us at Iowa State for many years now, and we're really grateful for letting us do experiments on his farm and for keeping such a great organic farm for us to utilize. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Kathleen. I think she wanted me to go first. That's because everything that I say that's wrong, these guys can correct it later on. This is probably way too low. Okay. She said, I'm Paul Muggy. I'm from far northwest Iowa. Um, I'm a small organic farmer. I just have 300 acres. I farm more for a while, but uh, really think I'm better off without it just because timing is so critical and I'm mostly by myself and I can just do a better job if I have everything right there at home. This is, this is my family. I get a little help from my kids and grandkids. They did all the bean walking this year actually. And I put my contact information up there. If anybody wants to get a hold of me at any time, that would be, that would be great. Uh, I don't always answer the phone, but I'll try and get back to you. And I think we're doing the three of us in order and then some questions. So we'll kind of go through this kind of quickly. Whoops. Okay, current rotation, uh, corn, soybeans, and small grain. And the small grain always has red clover in it uh, to get nitrogen for the following corn crop. I've planted a number of different uh, small grains. I've tried lots of different things. Um, there is no perfect small grain. I've kind of settled on uh, fall triticale is, is my favorite. Uh, for one thing, I have a market for that. I, I it sold a seed through Albert Lee Seed. And the other thing is, it's really nice to have a fall seeded crop in the rotation because it screws up the cycle of the summer annual weeds. And I can no-till it right behind the, the soybean combine. So that works really good. So it goes corn, soybeans, and then small grains. <clears throat> soybeans, I rotate tillage as well as crops. And I think that's important because if, if you do the same thing all the time there are particular weeds and insects too that are are going to be particularly adapted to that system so you have to you can't be married to any one thing in other words you have to keep mixing it up so the the soybeans are ridge tilled i know antonio said that you know there aren't aren't very many of us ridge tillers anymore and that's unfortunate because it's a great system for organic soybeans uh, if you're not familiar with it, the upper left is the rows on the left have been have been planted. Um, so the planting is really the first trip through the field in the spring. So it's basically no-till except that I'm going to do rotary hoeing and, and cultivating. It's uh, so it's good as far as resource conservation goes. It's good as far as um, not having any primary tillage saves fuel and time, and it's. It really helps with weed control, especially grass control. Uh, and the bottom right is 
what it looks like later in the season, hopefully. And I, I should say, you know, disclaimer here that you, you always take the pictures where it looks really good. <laughs> you know, doesn't always look like that, but uh, when Mother Nature cooperates, it, it kind of works. Um, the small grains, uh, like I said, the advantage of a fall seeded crop is that I can, I can no-till it. Um, you can barely see the, you know, soybeans in the background haven't even been combined yet, so I just I follow right behind the combine with the drill. It, it looks pretty black, but if you went back to that field a week later, you couldn't even really see that you, that you planted it. Uh, let's see. Uh, fertility management. I get, like I said, I have red clover in with the small grain. This is triticale with red clover in it. The red clover just kind of sits there about six inches tall or so until you combine that, that small grain and then it takes off. Uh, this would be about Labor Day or so, um, and it's in a good year, will be 18 inches tall or so and all flowered out. There will be a few weeds in it. So I clip it, and then the, the clover comes back, gets ahead of the weeds, and ideally it will be just clover. It'll be, you know, a foot tall again, you know, and stays green till Christmas time, usually. And, you know, there's living, living roots in the soil all year long. This is a special a kind of red clover that I have. I should maybe mention it was developed at University of Florida. My thinking was if I brought it up here to the Midwest, it wouldn't survive the winter because I don't do any primary tillage. I can't plow it. And to a certain extent, that's, that's true. In a, in a severe winter, it won't make it through. Um, if it does, it's really easy to kill. Just a disc in a field cultivator and it's pretty much gone. So killing it's not an issue. So I get, as a, as a kind of an educated guess, 80 to 100 pounds of nitrogen from that clover. I have manure then. I had a, a really good deal with cow-calf manure that I got from a neighbor. I gave him my, my straw for my small grains, and then he gave me back the manure bedding at the end of the day, and I composted it, and, and then he sold the cows. <laughs> but I get... Uh, I get broiler litter now. It has been composted a little bit with wood chips, and I have a, a compost turner that I start turning it at that point, and it gets, it gets really hot, uh, and I, hot enough to kill the weed seeds, at least. I uh, pro probably should turn it a little more to keep it from getting as hot as it does. But it makes really good compost. It's like what you'd buy at Walmart or Earl May or something. It is spread um, with one of the, the vertical beater spreaders. They do a, a really good job um, of controlling how much they put on and even spread and, and all of that. Probably around two tons per acre of compost. And I don't. As far as the certification goes, I don't call it compost. I mean, it's raw manure, because like Kathleen said, you have to you know, turn it every so often and take temperatures and all that in order to meet the certifications, and, and I don't care. So is it, is it working? Um, yeah, usually, usually it does. I do a lot of uh, rotary hoeing, tine weeding, row crop cultivating things like that. I have uh, RTK guidance on my tractor. I have camera guidance for the cultivator, which works really, really well. I also have a flame cultivator that I use some. I, you, know, you just have to have lots of tools in your machine shed, and you use what's appropriate at the moment. Sometimes one thing will work better than, than something else. Uh, so again, you can't be married to any particular system. So, uh, well, you can see in, the, in a good year, things work out as far as weed control. As far as insect control, I've never, I've been doing this for, been organic for 20 some years. I, 
I have had a problem with soybean aphids for a while until Iowa State's aphid-resistant beans um, that carry genetic resistance. That kind of took care of that problem. And I really have not had any other serious insect issues. I, I probably would have European corn borers, except all my neighbors have BT corn. So I can't really claim that as a free ecosystem service, I guess, but uh, I haven't had any, any serious issues, and part of it's because of the longer rotation. Uh, I do have some alfalfa in the rotation as well, mainly where I have Canada thistles. It's uh, one of the best ways of at least managing Canada thistle. Disease control, I, again, I really haven't had any, any issues. I, uh, and as far as fertility goes, I haven't, I was getting really high in phosphorus and low in potassium, like we've talked about because of my history with manure. I did, so I did buy some uh, potassium sulfate one year. But now the, the broiler litter is higher in potassium relative to phosphorus and also higher in nitrogen. So I think that problem will be less as, as we go along. Uh, yields are, are pretty good. I, I give up a little bit to my neighbors because I'm going to plant late, especially with corn. My beans are the, the tofu type food grade beans, which will yield a little bit less, but you know, I get 200 bushel corn and 60 bushel beans sometimes. Uh, as far as conservation goes, uh, I do have contour rows on probably two thirds of my farm. And I don't have really steep slopes, but they're, but they're fairly long slopes. Um, so most of the farm is contoured. Uh, I also have prairie strips, which is I was really glad to hear Antonio talk about them. Uh, I'm pretty high on them. You can see them in the, in the right. And the, the strips are on the contour, and usually they will end on one side of the field in a, in a grass headland, and on the other end of that strip is going to be a grass waterway. And so any water that runs off hopefully will end up in the grass waterway. And uh, even as I plant, I have 12 row equipment. And where most people will have a headland alongside that waterway, I don't do that. I just plant my, if, if this is the waterway, I'll plant the 12 rows right into that waterway. And then the next 12 rows moves over so that the, the edge of the waterway looks like a sawtooth. But again, you know, with all uh, the cultivation that I'm doing, I have like a, a mini terrace every 30 inches that directs all of the, all of the runoff water into that, into that waterway. Uh, again, I have grass waterways, grass headlands, and uh, they're pretty. I think that's probably about it. Oh, some of the, some of the management uh, issues that we can talk about a little bit later with the 823. Um, I will come back to this slide later. Ron and I will talk about, about some of these things. And I think, you know, in summary, I have, I'm sure I have some soil erosion. Everybody does. But I have very little, I think. Um, and I'm putting almost no nitrogen phosphorus into the water because I'm not applying any. I have good yields, lower input costs than, than conventional guys, no inputs, basically, in 20-some years. My soil test levels are staying very good. In fact, too high in phosphorus. My soil organic matter is mostly 5% or higher. You know, certainly there's room for improvement. I'd like to cut out tillage trips if I could. But I think I'm doing a relatively good job, but I don't think I would meet the qualifications for that, the 823 program. And that's, that's something that we can talk about uh, again in a, little, in a little bit. So, Ron, I think you're up. Thanks, Paul. And yeah, we'll return to your slide here at the end and see if there's more discussion on it. 
um, move into Ron's. And Ron is another wonderful farmer cooperator we've been working with for 25 years. Um, he and his sons farm in Harlan, Iowa. So beautiful organic farm and really wonderful soil quality that we've done a lot of sampling out there too. Take it away, Ron. Can I, can I nope. take this? Nope, yep, stand here. Oh. Sorry, because of the Zoom. Darn, <laughs> Kathleen, she's tough. <laughs> uh, Ron Roseman, uh, Western Iowa. Uh, little introduction. I had uh, the great pleasure and privilege of being a founding board member of Practical Farmers of Iowa and the second president. Um, now our son David is the first, second generation board member and he's now the vice president. We've grown to 6,600 members. So I say I have a PhD. I got a degree in biology, but my PhD, because of Practical Farmers of Iowa, is, I wrote this down somewhere, because <laughs> I just thought of it. Oh, Practical Human Discovery and Discernment. What that really means is making lots of mistakes <laughs> and doing lots of experiments which we have done in PFI. We've done around 50 randomized replicated field trials uh, since PFI started uh, back in 1986. Uh, this year has been a year of milestones, 50th year of farming, 45th year of marriage on September 16th, uh, 40 years of no pesticides on uh, 700 acres, uh, certified now for organic for going on 30 years this next year. So lots of milestones. Uh, two out of the three sons are farming, which is wonderful. Our third son works for the Foreign Agricultural Service of USDA. Uh, he and his, his wife works for the state department. Uh, they were in India. Uh, she's a troubleshooter getting, if American citizens get in trouble overseas, she is one of the people to bail them out. And Mark is a trade negotiator. Uh, he, they were in India, but now they're, they just moved to Bogota, Colombia. So we're anxious to go see them down there. Uh, my wife, Maria, uh, is also heavily involved in farming. She runs the store on our farm, uh, marketing our own beef, pork, popcorn, and eggs. Uh, we've had our own labels for about 22 years called Rose, simply Roseman Family Farms. Talk about diversified. I guess we are diversified in businesses as well as production because there are three families uh, surviving on 700 acres. So we have a restaurant, farm table, farm to table restaurant in Harlan called Milk and Honey. And uh, we also have a farm table delivery service for uh, uh, where uh, our daughter-in-law buys uh, produce and from about 50 different growers and uh, resells them and, re and distri distributes them all over the state of Iowa and in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, some more on our farm. Hey. Oops, what's going on here? I hit the wrong button. What did I do here? I gotta go back. On 700 acres, we have 50 different fields, which is a lot, but they're all set up based on contours and grass waterways and slopes. You know, we don't have flat land like uh, uh, Paul does, so we've actually just gone to six row equipment. We were getting tired of four row ridge till, and then we had an eight row uh, conventional planter after alfalfa. Uh, 
but we've gone to six row 38s, which is wide, but we have our combine that fits down the r ridges, very important for us. Um, I'm, I'm gonna get uh, uh, what we raise. We, we plant about 15 to 20 different crops every year, besides corn and soybeans. Corn and soybeans is about half the farm, 350 acres. The other half is in, uh, pasture, hay, small grains, and cover crops. We have uh, 90 Red Angus beef cows, uh, 40, 30 to 40 sows in a feral to finish operation, and 200 egg layers. Uh, what meat we don't sell through our own business goes through Organic Valley, which we are very grateful for, especially on the pork. The majority of all our beef goes through our own label. Most of my slides are from just a couple days ago. Uh, this is the start of our compost pile where we've been composting manure. We don't have much there at this time of the year. But then this is on the Marshall soils, the flat portion of our farm on the high ridge. But I guess. Uh, one reason I put the slide in is that we live in a world of extremes now in lots of ways, but certainly the climate is one of them. And I think, you know, we think about climate resiliency every day, and I think that's something that we need to take in consideration when we're uh, looking at uh, this program, uh, 823. How, how are, you know, we have a system here and uh, I will argue with anyone that the diversified crop and livestock system, whether you're conventional or organic or anything, is still the best farming system there ever was and ever will be. Because you can close your nutrient cycles uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, in getting them to flow and... Uh, uh, you can maintain more control over your operation. You can have legumes. You can have uh, pasture. You can have more perennials. Uh, it makes for a closed system. Like Paul said, he hasn't purchased any inputs. Uh, we have not purchased any nitrogen per se other than when I was working with Antonio and Dr. Blackmer, before I was organic, we did liquid 28% with uh, using the late spring soil nitrate test, and it worked beautifully. But when you're certified organic, you can't use liquid 28. We're, we're limited on, uh, you know, what we can use for nitrogen and so forth. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway... Uh, Essentially, no nitrogen in 40 years, and that's just kind of people, conventional farmers just don't understand how we can get such good yields. But also this slide quickly. Okay, an inch and a half of rain in May and June total. Getting desperate. Nothing, stuff is starting to look a little ugly. First week in July, we get three inches. It saved us for that time period. Nothing again until Scott, the night of your field day, came home in that morning during the night, the night, 4.8 inches. Every drop went in. No rain until two days ago again three-tenths, yet our soybeans, because we planted a little late, we thought we were complaining because we were making equipment changes and trying to move into a different place for the restaurant. We were way behind. Our beans are this tall. There are 3.4 late bean. We counted the pods per plant, 40 up to 68 pods per plant and 175,000 plants per acre. I think we're going to have beans. <laughs> yeah. 
the corn, the ears are smaller, but they're filled out to the ends. I can't make any predictions. I don't know. We'll see. But I guess what I'm showing is in spite of extremes, we are very resilient, and that's what we need to be striving for. And being diverse, diverse, and having diverse crop rotations has great value. And how much time? I'm quickly running out? Okay. Maybe since I'm on that resiliency stuff, I wrote down some things here a couple nights ago, and I kind of said, well, to myself, what are the factors that should determine some of these standards uh, for uh, 823? And then these are things we're doing on our farms, and that is uh, diversity of rotations, diver diversified crops and livestock, rotational grazing, uh, perennials on the farm, ecosystem services that enhance organic systems. And I'm going to move on here, having said that one. Well, this isn't right. Uh, I need to go. Is it this one? No, no. That one, yeah. I, oh, that's the second one. Yeah. No, that's not the, that's the second one? Oh, okay. I got my slides out of order. Anyway, uh, we have a pond, for instance, we put in in 2020. Uh, we're concerned about uh, saving water down the road. Um, I could speak a lot about this pond, but I, I won't. But it's... We're just getting started with that, uh, trying to make improvements and plant trees and shrubs, et cetera, and prairie species around it. And, uh, I guess you can see there's some rotational pasture there in the front, organic soybeans, corn, uh, a pasture close to our feed lot since we are uh, finishing our cattle out for meat sales, uh, but we have to have access to pasture, you know, for 30% of our ration during a dry matter intake during the uh, growing season. But when I'm, when I'm talking about ecosystem services, I mean such things as uh, trees for shade. We actually plant them on terraces, and I know NRCS has always told me they're not too happy about that. But uh, I would say what, I mean, those ponderosa pine are 40 years old there. I think they're doing a tremendous amount of good. They, I have crows that nest in there. Uh, all the beneficial birds and insects that are predators help in these ecosystem services. And on the, on the other side of that terrace on the left, we are starting uh, more hardwoods, uh, such as uh, pecans. Uh, we have hazelnuts growing on the slope there. You can see some of them there. Uh, and also uh, uh, chestnuts and uh, just some of the oaks, oak trees, getting more into uh, native hardwoods too and getting away from the evergreens, especially such things as blue spruce, ones that aren't native. Uh, white pine is certainly a good one. Concolifer is another really good one. I'm a tree, tree nut, so... Anyway, there, there you'll see a three-acre forest that I planted in 30 years ago. 
but we have wildlife that nobody else does. We have great horned owls, barred owls. Uh, we have uh, we have our very own northern harrier. It's called it's nicknamed the gray ghost, and I think it's because they have a territory of one square mile. We have 640 acres contiguous. We are able to have enough habitat diverse and, and then some CRP around us too from the neighbors. The, the Northern Harrier is called the gray ghost because it just hovers over your fields very silently and it's black and gray colored. It's just a wonderful creature to have. And you'll see there, those soybeans are not 100% weed free. We have never tried to have our fields 100% weed free because you can't. Number two, we try to manage weeds, not eliminate them. Now there is one weed we do try to eliminate and that is giant ragweed. That is the biggest nemesis for us it has become a super weed that is being researched at various land grants in the Midwest. Well, we do compost manure uh, for 40 years now. We bought a compost turner. That picture was taken uh, two years ago, November 28th. Talk about climate change, though. Here, you look at the heat. We had just turned the pile with our uh, turner, and, uh, uh, you know, by the end of the winter, we will have about 1,000 tons of compost. Yeah. So we're, we're actually putting on about 800 ton a year, three to four ton per acre. We absolutely have no phosphorus issues, absolutely. If anything, we're low because we have so much alfalfa, you know. And also, uh, K, we are naturally high in western Iowa with K. I've never put on any K ever. Phosphorus, I did put on some dry rock phosphate in the past, a little. Just to show uh, oats, we grow oats for human consumption uh, to grain millers for oatmeal. There again, you can just see the diversity. Okay, th this is showing ridge till just, I've never shown this slide before, but I thought it was good for the purposes of 823 here because it shows us shredding. Uh, those are actually just weeds and grass there uh, in the spring prior to planting soybeans. But you know, your weeds and grass can serve as a cover crop too there. But in an ideal world, I would like to grow like Dick Thompson did annually uh, cover crops, maybe three rows on the ridge only, because then you can control it. I, I've done the, the full spectrum of cover crop, and it, it, it can be very problematic, you know, in a dry year or in a wet year. I have done some no-till rolling. Of, boy, I, I like... Nobody's doing it on their whole farm. You gotta be so terribly careful. If we'd have done it this year, I suspect our beans wouldn't have come up because we had no rain. The year I tried it, 2007, we had no rain until the first week in July, and they finally came up. They were planted like June 10th, maybe. Finally came up, but I only got 20 bushel an acre. Uh, so I think we have to be really careful. You know, we got to make a living, like Antonio was saying. 
we try to do things practical. You know, we're not purist on any single thing. We And flexibility. Just as we have to be flexible, I hope there can be some flexibility in the program here. That's always very tough to do with uh, where you, you know, you've, you've you know, you follow the standards, and if you don't meet the standards, well, you're going to be penalized. Anyway, uh, okay. I, I, there's so much one can talk about, and you just can't cover it all, but soil quality is certainly very important to us. In fact, you know, I'm concerned about that as much as I am, uh, just as much as climate change, you know, because they kind of go hand in hand. So, I don't know how, how to say this. Well, well, getting back, maybe getting back to this slide or maybe the next one. Yeah, we can use this. In the 1990s, we were... NRCS came out, and based on our rotation of back then, it was corn, beans, corn, beans, small grains, two years of hay, seven years. Now we're more corn, beans, small grains, hay, hay, or corn, beans, small grains, hay. We're getting away from the four straight years of row crop. But anyway, what my point is, they said we were meeting Russell too back then based on our rotation, our ridge till, and contours, and cover crops. I, I very much like to plant cover crops at second cultivation, if I can get, get it done. Sometimes it's hard to get it done. But what we do for trips, we, do, we only do one rotary hoeing because we can't hardly find the time to get that accomplished. We got so much going on because we don't have any hired employees, believe it or not. It's just the the three the two grown men and the one old guy. <laughs> and then we we have a 10-year-old grandson that's starting to get involved too. Uh, so anyway, we do run ro rotary hoeing and two cultivations and then there's no Nothing until the next year when you sweep that ridge off, you know. So that's about as good as we can do. And the reason we do ridge till, four times throughout the 90s and 2000s, we did the randomized replicated PFI trials where we compared disking to ridge till soybeans and we hand counted the weeds and we always had seven times more weeds in the conventional versus the ridge till. But, okay, ridge till's not easy to do. You don't learn it overnight. The equipment isn't available like it used to be because the company went out of business virtually. Uh, that's a whole subject in itself. But I think organic farmers are really struggling with weed control. I see that as about their number, one of their number one issues. How to get weed control without doing all kinds of different things. Like, you know, like Paul says, you gotta have a lot of tools in the toolbox. Ours are, we don't use a tine weeder, maybe we should, but you know, the, the, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is the jury, the jury has been out for a long time and is still out on how to control weeds and organic systems. Uh, yes, perennial crops certainly may be the answer. <laughs> yes, we need to be looking at more of that, of course, for lots of reasons. I guess that's it for my slides. Uh, oh, I'll close with this. Um, I wrote down, uh, the, based on 
who a guy that I have a, a lot of respect for is Matt Liebman. He's retired now, agronomist from Iowa State. And he he's had, he did 20 years of uh, uh, field trials at the Marsden Experimental Station on the different rotations, just you know, similar to Kathleen in some ways. Oh, Kathleen says he copied it, which, yeah, he did, probably. Yeah, he did. But he was looking at maybe a few more indicators, Kathleen, such as <laughs> he had more money. Uh, anyway, oh, anyway, is it decreasing CO2 emissions? Yes, that's what our system does because we have a lot of his rotations. Does it decrease energy use? Yes. Does it decrease erosion? Yes. Does it decrease purchased fertilizers and pesticides? Yes. Does it improve water quality? Yes. Does it save water? Well, hope that we don't know that, hopefully, yes. Does it improve soil quality? Yes. Does it sequester carbon? Maybe, but it's a slow process. And uh, uh, does it keep, does it increase diversity? And last, does it keep the ground covered as much as realistically possible? And uh, that's something that uh, I think there will be a lot of debate on or discussion on for our purposes is how do we keep the ground covered realistically and still make it practical? I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, we're not all going to be able to roll down rye because of uh, climate and weather uh, variability. Uh, cover crops won't always sprout based on weather. Um, oh, jeepers. Now how much time? One minute. I get on my soapbox, but my last soapbox item is hybrid rye. We've been doing that since the start of hybrid rye. First, on an experimental basis. It's the first small grain to be hybridized. Yields twice as much as common rye. Uh, it's very uniform, only grows about uh, waist to about this high. Um, I think it could become Iowa's third crop if there's a couple really big ifs. When I say that, I mean for conventional farmers. If Tyson and Smithfields of the world and so forth and the chicken people would say to the people finishing hogs or raising birds, etc., use hybrid rye as a feed ingredient. Okay, the farmer grows it, they buy it. That provides a third crop. It's planted in the fall, keeps the ground covered, yields twice as much as regular rye. You got the straw. If you combine it for feed, you can use the straw to move to solid manure systems. What if we did that in pigs, especially? Just think what it could do to water quality and smell, better neighbors. It would at least be a huge step in the right direction. It wouldn't get us back to having livestock on just about every farm like we used to, like I would ideally like. But, you know, we have these extremes. We have that extreme, putting all the, all the livestock under one roof, which is absolutely nuts, yet we can't change it politically. Uh, and only, I think, only climate change and more human suffering will bring it about someday. So I'm going to end on that happy note. Uh.
Thank you, Ron. So now our last farmer panelist, Scott Shriver. Let's see if I can find your slides here. Sorry, as we're Ron's. That should be up here. Yeah, and so Scott, again, another one of our great farmer cooperators we've worked with for 10, 15 years now. And um, he farms about 2,000 organic acres in Jefferson, Iowa. And he's our, not token, but um, farmer who has worked with NRCS programs. So I asked him to talk about his experience, what programs he's applied for, how it was. He's in the um, Greene County office, correct? Is that right. where you would go? Okay. Take it away, Scott. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Well, that's a, a tough act to follow, Ron. And uh, I'm going to get up here, and, I'm gonna, and it's just funny because Ron and Paul do things their way. We kind of do things our way. I'm not nearly as diverse. I'm bigger. But um, yeah, I've admired both those guys the way they farm for, you know, the whole time I've ever farmed. So um, with that being said, I'll go on. Um, again, my name is Scott Shriver. Um, I'm from Jefferson, Iowa. Uh, oh, we've had the family farm in our in our family for I think I'm the fourth generation, and and my son's working for me now. He'd be the fifth generation. We farm about 2,000 acres. Um, we started in 1998. F started farming organically in 1998, and just converted a couple fields at first. I mean, it took us 10 years. Um, it's a learning curve if you're going to do this. Um, from a standpoint of, of managing labor and managing equipment. I mean, you don't start out with all the tools in the tool shed the first year. And so you start out small and you kind of grow, you grow into that. Um, we've probably always um, uh, emphasized our corn and soybeans. Uh, when really, when we first started the soybeans, uh, and I got into organics because, I mean, conventional farming was tough back then. And I mean, it was strictly a monetary decision. We, uh, we bought a small farm that could go right into organic without transition. So we thought we'd give it a try. And, uh, and before the NOP, we've talked about the NOP, the primary thing was soybeans. And, and you were certified. And, um, but your certifier, it, it depended on who your buyer was. They looked to different certifiers. Uh, now your certifiers are pretty much all the same. They're certifying all to the NOP. Um, but, uh, you know, we were getting $16 a bushel for soybeans, and there was hardly even a corn market, but if you had organic corn, I think you could get $3 for it. And, uh, but that was still better than $1.85, so um, anyway. But we concentrated on the corn and beans. We felt like, you know, the, the small grain um, just adds diversity. It adds that weed cycle. You know, it breaks up weed cycles and disease cycles and insects, so... We've always had that in there, but rather than for us be a three-year rotation, we've tried to do more of the corn and beans. So we're kind of in a five-year rotation, but with three crops, corn, beans, and I call it small grains as one crop. I mean, we've grow, um, and, and almost every year we grow barley, wheat, and, uh, and oats. Um, but I kind of consider that one crop. And then we also do quite a few cover crops. Um, You'll see my rotation is, um, I kind of started out with beans, corn, beans, corn, and then a small grain. And for years it was corn, beans, corn, beans, and a small grain. Because I think that's growing your small grain after beans works better. But we're trying to do, in, the, in one of those bean years, we're trying to do that where we plant into the standing rye and roller crimp the rye. And what we've really found is that to make that work, we've got to plant that rye early. So planting that rye after a small grain gives us the opportunity to get it planted in the first part of September. Um, this year is, uh, I've tried that now for a couple of years and it's proved to be true, but this year especially, I've got one field that we didn't do that. And we planted that rye from a corn bean standpoint pretty early. We planted it at like the 5th of October uh, after corn, but it's just cold. I mean, it was, it all grew, and, and, but it just never covered the ground in the fall. The, the, the rye that we planted in the 10th of September or so, um, it, didn't, it doesn't grow real tall in the fall, but it, it completely tillers out and it completely covers the ground. And then that's the way it starts in the spring. And, and I think it's that early covering the ground that really is key to your weed control in that system. Um, 
and and this year the the field that was planted October 5th it's you can hardly see the beans in them it's just almost solid foxtail uh, the broadleaves weren't too bad um, and we actually had them walked but um, and there'll be beans there but I'm guessing if we get 30 bushel an acre I'll be real happy with that and I think our other fields um, and we walk those too but um, oh I don't know I'm 50 50 plus bushel an acre I think even this year um, there's some things that and and you know every I think the the biggest downside to you know you talk about the weather problems that you might have with this is that if it's dry and that rice suck the water out of the ground that the beans you know the beans get off to a slow start and I don't know if it's because the rice sucks the water out of the ground or or you, it, they're just trying to fight up through that mat um, of, of dead rye um, but it also gives you some resiliency and some benefits over your other system because we've got disasters in our conventionally tilled beans also um, and, and you know, I'm not ridge till but you know where we've got full coverage and we're, we're if you get a rain in that early season of you know planting the beans say right after you plant your beans and you can't get in the field for 10 days you're going to have a ton of foxtail and you can take care of most of it but a lot of it's going to be in the row and it'll show up later in the season um, with the no-till system we found i mean it's it's if you get in there and plant it and if you've got enough moisture to get the beans to grow you're not um you, you don't have that issue you, you plant the beans and you're done for the year you plant it and roll it and if it's a wet spring, the fact that that rise sucked the water out of the ground, I think you can get in and plant in times that you can't probably get in and plant in a conventionally tilled season. So just like everything, there's pluses and minuses, and it goes both ways. Um, uh, Kathleen wanted to you know, talk about fertility a little bit. Um, we do soil tests every four years. Um, and well, and I say every four years. and. It, uh, and I'll, I guess I say we say that because I think that's the rule or the law that we have to do to, you know, for our man management plans. We're getting now to where we're going to test every other year and then every third year. So every, because our five-year rotation just kind of works that way. If we want to soil test before a soy or a corn crop, um, it's it's the second year and the and the fourth year, which then makes it three years later for the other one. Um, we do a two and a half acre grid sampling. Uh, we've done some management zones. We're kind of getting to where we're going all the two and a half acre grid sampling. Uh, when we look at our soil tests, um, we look at pH first and, and we lime probably first. Um, but we've kind of got to the point with organics, we just hardly lime anything anymore. Um, we just don't seem to need it. In fact, if anything, we're kind of fighting higher you know, we're, our pHs are, you know, a lot over seven and, and some in the seven fives. Um, we've got where we put down calcium every year, even though our, our soil tests have us high in calcium, but I've, there's some other tests you can do where you can test the availability of that calcium and the, our, our available calcium is low. So we're, we're going with a product called CalSol or SO4 that is readily available and, and we think that kind of helps um, really with our weed control and foxtail. Foxtail is probably our, our nemesis in weeds. I mean, just everything else we seem to be able to handle one way or another. Um, but our primary fertilizer is animal manures as I think it probably, if, if, you're, if you're having to bring in fertilizers anyway, um, it's animal manures and, and we, we fertilize before corn and we fertilize before our small grains. Um, the hog manure, uh, we have outdoor pits, so our, our tests on the hog manure, that average there of 33, 15, 20 is per thousand gallons. And uh, it's a little low if you've got a deep pit barn, generally it's higher than that. But, um, and we put on about 6,000 gallons an acre or chicken manure. We have enough of our own hog manure and a neighbor's hog manure to about ha to do about half, and then we buy about uh, half of our acres covered with uh, raw chicken manure at three tons per acre. And the analysis there is what they uh, what they give us for that. Um, for small grains, we do about a half rate of of those two things. Um, 
seems like nitrogen we're, we're always on the on the short end or and it's inconsistent it's it's what um, Antonio was talking about it's in, in both of these whether it's I think the analysis or the application um, or, or just the consistency of the product itself but it does seem like we get a lot of inconsistencies with manure and um, so partly we just li you know you have to live with it and partly you might make up for it a little bit by maybe you know putting on a rate that you think covers some of those low ends of those consistency inconsistencies um, we are finding our phosphorus levels are getting a little bit on the high side we're probably in that I don't know 30 to 30 to 45 parts per million range um, and then but but again I think the hard part about it for us is that you know 75 percent of our field might be in the high range but there might be 25 percent or you know let's say even 15 percent in the low range and then another 10 percent in the really high range well how do you apply one thing and not that it can't be done but there isn't a lot of people and, and how do you apply one product I should say that's manure even if you think well okay we can variable rate it but really not a lot of people do that um, but you're applying three different things out of that manure you're applying nitrogen you're applying phosphorus and you're applying potassium so the same part of the ground that might be low in phosphorus and you want to put more manure there um, but you can't or, or you're high in phosphorus and you want to put you know less manure there well you need the nitrogen so you still put on the same amount because you need the nitrogen um, and again that's just you know something we're having to live with um, our potassium is getting a little bit on the low side like uh, um, 120 parts maybe um, not not real low but uh, and it, but again it's sort of the same problem I mean we're um, but we have some areas that are just fine and some areas it might be high and then some areas it might be really low and it's just hard to apply one product manure um, that you know fits all these things we are looking to supplement our low potassium areas with some potassium sulfate um, there's another product called uh, polysulfate that's a similar product but it's uh, um, just a little bit different um, and both these are you know OMRI certified and okay to do with organic um, we haven't really addressed any of our low phosphorus areas. There aren't too many, and um, but we might look into some rock phosphate or something like that too. Um, that's about it on fertility. The NRCS programs that we've done, uh, we do a lot of CRP. Um, there and 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 you know the CRP programs. There's different types of CRP. We do farmable potholes. And where we've done those, we've done those, I'll say, because of organic. Um, we've found that, you know, there's just some areas that, and especially when we started 20 years ago, it seemed like we were just wet all the time. Um, now these last five years, it's, we probably could have farmed these areas, but these areas were very difficult to farm organically because they were, you know, they keep you out of the field uh, most of the time. So we've, we've put some, some of these farmable potholes in, um, to make the rest of the field, I guess, easier to farm. Um, and uh, there's some field borders, quail buffers, um, things like that that we've put in to CRP so that, uh, you know, they take up our, our buffer strip between our, chem our conventional neighbors. Um, filter strips are not so much an organic thing. I think they're just a good idea to always have a filter strip in, you know, in front of your creek bank or something like that. And, and we have those pretty much everywhere that we can. Um, we've got 28 different CRP contracts, about 263 acres in CRP. Um, so it's kind of a combination of, you know, doing it because of organic, but also doing it because I think it's a, a good thing to do uh, from a conservation standpoint. Um, the CSP program, I'm actually on my fourth contract. We just started our fourth one this year. Um, and it's been a good program and and to the benefit of our NRCS office I th and and the program there there's benefit there's benefits that we get as being organic farmers 
that you don't get as being a conventional farmer in the CSP program. I mean, they give you, you know, the whole, it's got like a point system, and there's, you know, certain points that you get for not putting out chemicals and things like that. And, um, and I'm sure there's some things that we do that uh, probably a little more tillage that don't necessarily help us in that program, but um, it's actually worked for us pretty good. Um, when we first started doing the uh, uh, soybeans, planting soybeans in the standing rye, uh, there was an equip program. There was really two equip programs, and one was for a cover crop, one was for a one-year no-till thing that kind of went together real well and worked for us to just give us a few extra dollars per acre to kind of work with this system and, and try it out. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't made for what we were doing with the planting the soybeans in the standing rye, but yet the system fit what we were doing and, and it allowed us to, um, to use it. Um, I've generally found the NRCS office to be like, um, like you said, sorry. Uh, we, you know, you have to kind of see these things, read about them, hear about them and go to the office and find out, uh, and, and, but once you do, they've always been real helpful for me to, uh, to, to then take my ideas, because I'm really not sure, you know, really what I'm doing. I'm walking in saying, hey, how about this? And then they've been good about, uh, you know, telling me how it w can work for me, and I think they do what they can to make it work for me, which is, which is nice, so that's all I got. Thank you, Scott. All right, I'm um, gonna go back to that slide that Paul had up about what they, what um, Ron and Paul were a little concerned about as far as um, issues for the A23, if I can find it. No, it wasn't in Ron's. But does anybody have any questions for the farmers, and particularly NRCS folks, because this is probably something rare to get exposure to um, experienced organic farmers in your training, and this is the chance to pick their brains if you guys have any questions for them. Um, Josiah, can you help me find Paul's slides? Well, we got a question over here. Ron, why won't the swine producers include hybrid rye in their rations? Wait, microphone. because it's, you got too late of a soybean, so some are saying if you can get earlier maturing beans, then it will work. But here, we did relay cropping last year where we planted the hybrid rye, planted, planted the soybeans when the rye was just starting to head out, maybe, well, it was already headed out, it, June 7th last year combined the rye above the beans. The beans were eight to 10 inches tall. Oh, I was really happy. I thought, I was estimating 35 plus bushel. Uh, we didn't get any rain after that. That really, a well, little bit, but we ended up with 25 bushel with double cropping. But the conventional producer, could make that work a lot easier than an organic producer could because he'd be using chemicals for weed control. So no, it could be done. It can be done. But they'd have to have that one year where they're planting after, maybe ideally after small grains to get the rye started at the most optimum time, like Scott says. Now, if farmers maybe were paid to do that in terms of all the pluses, you know, we green payment type of thing, an incentive, maybe they would. But I think key would be the livestock industry saying, hey, we're gonna work with you farmers. I know so many farmers would like to farm a little bit differently. I've been told that all the time Maybe, maybe not as much today as I did 20 years ago because the, the young guys don't know anything about what it used to be like either. You know, when there was livestock on every farm, every farm had hogs. They had, you know, it was, they don't know that. 
All right, other questions from the audience? Kevin, microphone. A few of you guys uh, mentioned uh, potassium sulfate, and I heard rock phosphate. You know, how readably is that? Or, I mean, where are you guys picking that up at? I mean, that's one way to balance some of this manure issue, but is it, is it expensive, or how far away do you have to get it? Do you have the microphone? <laughs> uh, as far as expensive, yes. Um, the, I think it's the West Bend Co-op um, will get it, uh, and, and then they just brought it to my farm and I spread it. But yeah, it's expensive. If you could get it in on the rail, you can get it from Idaho, for instance. That's where a lot of it is mined. But if railroads won't just buy or have one car load, car load, you know, I looked into it. If you could get a bunch of organic farmers to buy a, what, 200 ton or whatever comes on the rail in one car, or I forget how much it is, but if you, that's an issue, uh, volume. Otherwise, it's, the product is cheap. Getting it transported out here is a killer. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with both those guys, and, and that's why West Bend Co-op has a bunch, because there's a ton of organic acres up there. Um, the poly or the um, potassium sulfate isn't, uh, I know you can get it out in Illinois, um, and I'm not sure that that's where it's mined, but I, it, but yeah, if you want to probably get truckload quantities, and it's and it's not so. I mean, it's 450 a ton. I mean, it depends obviously, but um, I mean, it's more than MAP or DAP, but it's not 10 times more. I think your rock phosphate can be more, but there's a lot of organic. I mean, there's organic nitrogen you can buy, but it's 10 times more expensive. I mean, it's not as bad as some things. Right. Antonio, did you want to comment on that? Josiah's got the microphone. Just a couple of things. Uh, I mean, I agree with what they said. Now, there is also this um, um, potassium citrate, you know, that there is lots of propaganda about it, which they say is organic. Hmm. I, I have no clue. I don't know that one. So you may want to explore that. You see, uh, potassium citrate, hmm. that's, that's what it is. And apparently it is organic, certified organic. The other thing for the future is that uh, there may be something similar to uh, rock phosphate, rock potassium, okay. There has been, especially in South America, there has been research with uh, finely ground uh, feldspar, granite, okay. So, uh, some people call it nanoparticles, all that stuff. Now, uh, two years ago, actually, a company wanted to do some work with me. I, I said, listen, for this, you need at least four or five trials, at least three, four years, and I will be retiring, you know? And then when I told them how much money I needed, they say, forget it, Antonio, you see. Now, this is interesting because it's a different concept. It's like the rock phosphate. And I didn't talk about that, but I did trials in South America here with rock phosphate. And it is a great source uh, for maintenance, you know. It's no water-soluble pea, but it is about 10, 15 percent uh, um, acetic acid uh, soluble pea. And, uh, and it's good for long term. You see, the myth is that it's only good for organic farmers, you know, and for long term, you know, but for maintenance it can be applied anywhere. So if we get that, that potassium, you know, the problem is that what I heard is that the availability may be 10, 15 percent. And then you have the weight and the tons and the shipment. But that's something, you know, that maybe some young fertility guy, actually, I've, I've talked to some of my colleagues, they could start thinking about it. Because it could be a good thing, you know, just for maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the issue is where it's come from. How much would be to bring large amounts here? 
and the physical form, if it is like sand or if it is granulated or something, so I don't know. Okay, the other thing is that I need to leave. I can stay for the rest, but I really enjoy this meeting. I really appreciate Kathleen that you invited me. Hopefully what I talk was uh, uh, useful. I was telling Kevin that we gave the impression that if we had coordinated our talks. <laughs> yes. uh, it's, it's really a pleasure, but this this what Paul and Scott and, uh, and Ron mentioned is what I said several times today. You see, you guys are a special crowd of people. You are not just for uh, getting the profit. It's important, but you have, a, a, it's not just a business. It's a way of life. It's a way of not just getting larger, you know. It's a way of... Uh, getting more time for the management. The problem is, is that I'm, I'm hoping you guys are not dinosaurs, you know, in extinction, because that, that's what happened. See, I, see, there are good people that are conventional farmers. I, I work with them a lot, and some of them want to do things right. But what's the problem? Many out there, I ask them, hey, what's your fertilizer management? Oh, talk to my dealer. That's the answer. They don't have a clue. They don't have time. They have so many acres, acres. So it's a struggle. But actually, I am proud that we still have, especially some old friends. Uh, you guys give us hope. I will retire soon. And uh, after 50 years of work in South America here, kind of frustrated. Because some things we have been talking about, same thing for years. and. 70% of the farmers or consultants don't listen. You know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. But but being with you guys, it's, it was a pleasure. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Antonio. We really appreciate it. I do have question. a question from online. Oh. Uh, okay. Any ideas on how to sustain a long-term organic farm, 300 acres, broad acre, corn, soy, oat, alfalfa, Southwest Iowa, without much animal manures around. Cattle barn um, manure is okay and can access some, but dairy, swine, poultry, et cetera, are non-existent. Or should I consider custom feeding facilities to obtain more reliable manure? I realize a diverse rotation can benefit, but the time it takes can be detrimental to economically compete with conventional acres and or other alternatives. It appears to me established organic farms are all surrounded by CAFOs and manure is widely available and cheaper. Thanks. Good, good issue. And um, yeah, I mean, we get ours from a, a conventional source and um, it'd be nice to get it from an organic source, but we can't find any nearby. So Ron, do you want to answer that? Cause it's Southwest Iowa. Well, I'm thinking couple ideas, trade uh, alfalfa for manure, I guess. Uh, maybe graze some animals for somebody else to get the manure on your own acres, at least after, in the fall. But then you got to have some fences. One thing, we're one of the few farmers left in the state that have all the fences where we graze our cattle on all the whole farm after harvest, the whole farm. And man, I can visibly see the best gains in our spring calves and fall calves during that time period. I don't even have to weigh them, I can see it. So there's one way to get some fertility. I don't know, Paul, you got, I, as far as organic manure, if you don't, I don't know, is the, Chicken and turkey manure organic market saturated? I mean, where you can't get it? Yeah, the, the, the broiler manure that I get is not organic. Uh, yeah. I would, I would love to have organic manure, but yeah. Same with Scott, right? Yours is, right, it's, it's pretty tough to get organic manure. Um, question over here. Yeah, to you guys that um, from a marketing standpoint with the amount of money that is coming into this, if it takes, as this administration is hoping it, you know, with the money that's coming in this, will you, do you foresee that 
your premiums that you're getting might go away if you got more I mean you guys yield a little less but you get premium for that if you've got more people raising stuff organic um, do you see the premium coming down well I don't pretend to kind of have that big picture look necessarily but there uh, there's an awful lot of organic corn and soybeans that gets imported into the United States and the hope would be that we would grow our own and 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 not need that imported product so you think there's a big enough market still to I, I think there's a big enough market and the market's growing and I mean the markets brought in this outside you know foreign organic corn and soybeans um, but I think along with that we've got to police that organic corn and soybeans coming in to just make sure that it's truly organic too if, if it's going to continue to come in Ron and Paul got an opinion the future of organic <laughs> well it's, it's a matter of price too if the stuff that's coming in is is so cheap that we lose our profit margin you know that's going to have an effect too uh, you know if we if organic producers here that are growing corn and soybeans didn't have the the large uh, especially the large uh, egg and broiler organic large number people we'd be out of business well we'd be having these much much lower premiums so we are dependent at this time on that uh, industrial version of organic agriculture, which is large scale. But this is where I truly feel that the only real solution is to uh, start adding the externality cost to conventional food, our conventional industrial food system, which is so-called cheap food, but che no nutrients, junk food, and uh, extreme health costs. You know, we know everything that's bad, high energy. We never talked about nitrous oxide, for instance. There's another little baby out there that uh, most people don't even know about, what that's doing. Uh, if we add externalities to how it affects the environment, our health, and et cetera, then the only farming system that will survive is something like ours, some, at least. And it can be done on a large scale. Uh, that, that's, you look at Scott, you know, we could do it on a couple thousand acres and still have family farms, though, too. I mean, there's. If you talk about the overall uh, viability of organic farming, I think the probably the biggest thing I worry about over the next twenty to forty years is the fact that conventional farming and organic farming are going to kind of get closer together all the time. Mm -hmm. In that, I mean, when we first started organic farming, you didn't hear about biologicals, you didn't hear about um, a lot of the cover crops, a lot of things that we were do, we did as organic farming. Well. Um, and, and maybe it'd be a good thing. For, I mean, it, yeah. it'd be a good thing if, if conventional farming got closer to organic farming. But I, I think as it does, maybe that premium will, uh, our premium for organic might come down, but the premium for conventional farming might get better, and maybe people will farm better in that case. I, don't, I mean, there's just all ways to look at it. All right. Um. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to asking if Ben Lehman can come up to the podium, please. And we'll keep these topics behind us because these were the concerns that the farmers came up with in meeting 823 requirements. You know, you have to worry about if you have high pea soils, can you still use manure? That's our main source of fertility. If, less, if you have to use... Um, less than 50%, 50% or less of your nitrogen comes from manure. Will, will we have enough nitrogen from the legumes? You heard about the issues with legumes. If they don't, if you don't have the right weather, they might not survive. Um, 
and then your rear round soil coverage seemingly is okay, but again, with cover crops, they might not um, survive the winters, especially if you have harsh winter or and or no, no um, rainfall. And um, okay, I'll just leave the rest up there because those are, stir, for example, is not considered an absolute requirement. So um, Ben's family, his father Aaron Lehman here in next door in Polk County, they have applied for A23 and it looks like it's going forward. So I was asked him if he could talk about, do you know if any of these issues came up, how you addressed them, and then Clint, the um, Miller from NRCS is here that work with the Lehman family. So if he can add anything at the end too, we appreciate it. Because we want more people to sign up and get A23 funds. So thank you, Ben. Oh, and thank you all, and thank you for bringing up uh, these points, too, because this is all excellent stuff, uh, and definitely things that we were thinking over as well. Uh, one of the, the big ones, I would say, is that uh, less than 50% of N from uh, concentrated manure sources. It does include all of our other crops, too, so even you know the nitrogen or soybeans are fixing. Uh, nitrogen from the soil organic matter too so it's not just applied and it's not too intimidating once you break it down in that rotation for us at least uh, one of the big ones for us I would say and one of my favorite things I, I saw from working with Clint is they go through every farm operation. They look up every piece of equipment that you have and that you're using for tillage and whatnot, planting in the rotation. And they predict whether or not your organic matter is rising over time or dropping over time. And with our you know, annual rotation, no perennial legumes, no changes, uh, it is predicted to increase over time just as it is. And that's something you know, not only does it say that we are going to qualify for that point, but we can go to our landlords and we can actually say, you know, despite us doing this tillage, you know, we're adding all this stuff to the rotation. It is building that soil over time. That's a pretty powerful thing to be able to bring to the folks whose land you're caring for there. Uh, livestock, we, we didn't hit any livestock requirements in this. We don't have livestock on the farm. But I will say, uh, you know, it's just my dad that has applied for it so far. I only have one field to my name that's already organic. So I did not apply. It sounds like I probably will be able to apply. So uh, I'm going to end up having some discussions there. Uh, we're looking at uh, my dad's contract on a transitioning field, apparently one of, I think, 10 applications in the state. Uh, so it's over 200 bucks an acre. Uh, for five years and for you know a farm where you know, we've got operating lines we've got a lot of stuff to pay off it, it's a game changer it can help you sleep at night and it can uh, for me especially if I'm able to get that payment on an already organic field one of our long-term dreams is to bring li organic livestock to the farm and if that works out I, I think it'll move up that dream at least 10 years. And that's, it's really is a lifestyle change there. Uh, but it is a lot of paperwork. I'm hoping Clint can speak a bit to this, but it was uh, my dad and like four folks sitting in a room for about four hours or so, going through all of the farm operations and whatnot, especially on that 590 side. We're fortunate we don't have huge slopes. We do do the no-till soybeans. Uh, so you heard about five, I think it's five tons of soil per acre is your T, your tolerable loss. According to their definition, I'm guessing most folks in this room, that is not a tolerable loss. Uh, in our very worst year in the rotation, it was 1.2 tons per acre of soil, according to their calculation. So that's something we're pretty happy with. Uh, the actual contract itself uh, the habitat requirements, I think, are also in the additional criteria, right? So it's not a, like a strict requirement. That's more for the ranking, ranking process. But because we are working through this process uh, with our NRCS office, 
we're going to be turning our field buffers into CRP strips now. We were just making really poor quality alfalfa there. It was very weedy. Those weeds were getting into our crop fields. It's getting compacted. And now we're going to be able to have habitat there instead. And that's something I'm really happy with and something that wouldn't have happened if we wouldn't have been in that office and been getting that help from uh, these folks. So very, very grateful to all of them for all of their help and for everyone here that pays taxes. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate it. It's uh, taking the organic industry forward. And I think we're going to see a lot of this money stick in these communities and stick in organics. I don't think people are just going to spend it and go on vacations. I think they're going to build their farms and they're going to build the organic industry, which is really exciting to see. Can you talk about your forms? Oh, of course. I have uh, the forms with me here. Please, we, we have some time built in for hands-on stuff. If you want to see what we filled out, what a, a form looks like, come see that. The biggest one's going to be our 590. That was about 40 pages. Uh, most of that was not like filled out. A lot of that is the work the office puts into it, uh, where they go through all these formulas and whatnot uh, based on those different rotations. The easiest one is probably the pest management one, because we don't have to spray much on the organic side. So that's pretty quick and easy to, to figure out. Uh, and really, the, the quickest and easiest one I think we all got in our folders today, and that was one we filled out June 13th. The deadline was, I think, June 15th, and it was really just tax ID and your name and whatnot. And it's quick and easy to get that process started and to get uh, folks on your farm and helping you out. So, for sure. Uh, so stir, that's going to be the tillage intensity. Uh, average for our rotation is 91.7. Uh, so we're you know, between 40 and 60 in P and oat years in that rotation. Uh, you know, of course, we'd like it to be lower. But you know, it does show you, you know, even based on their formula, because we're adding in manure, because we're adding in cover crops, because when we're doing tillage, uh, we are incorporating stuff like all organic farms do. It's still you know, an acceptable level for them and well under those numbers. But I think we could look into ways to reduce that in the future too, though. Uh, a big one for us is uh, the small grains. Right now we have oats falling corn, which does not seem to be a good idea. I know I've heard from a lot of folks, uh, Scott and crew, uh, oats falling soybeans. The test weights just always seem to be so much better. We got some grain millers folks, and I, I think they will tell us that's the direction to head in. And that's one way we're looking to change that up. I'd really like to hear from uh, Clint and our NRCS folks about, you know, we, we've heard about uh, wanting to maybe make changes to rotations. And if it's a real dry year, moving from no-till soybeans to tilled soybeans, that we kill that rye off earlier. I'd be really curious how much time and energy it takes the NRCS office to do those calculations if we make a change in our rotations, that we can still be flexible and we're not really locked in to. Everyone who knows me knows that I'm not one to bite my tongue. So I'll, as Ben was talking, I was making my notes. That's how prepared I am for this. Um, so I'll just kind of comment on some of the stuff he said. Um, they're lucky enough. They're on very flat soils. Uh, we were kind of on the fence on whether we were going to run it on an A soil or a B soil for slope. Um, and so it was pretty lenient. That's why the soil loss is so low. And therefore, they're very low on their P index, which means we can apply to a nitrogen rate on their manure. If they wanted to put a full, I don't remember what it was, like 180 pounds of nitrogen, it was like 400 pounds of phosphorus we could apply uh, with that chicken litter that they were using. And 
Fortunately, they aren't willing to go that high because you know, they got to buy that manure. So uh, we're not going to get anywhere near that 400 pounds of N or P, but it was significant when we did the math, like, wow, that's a lot of phosphorus. And so long term, we're going to be building that number to where we're going to have soil tests that are now optimum. And now they're getting into the high and very high. And that's going to change the way that you can apply, because all of a sudden your P index is not going to be low anymore. It's going to be very limited. So that was some of the concerns we've had in doing a few of these organic producers through 590 or nutrient management. Um, he said 595, the pest management is easy. And it is because he's not they're not applying any pesticides yet. If they do start to apply something, we told them we're going to have to go back in and do the, a lot more analysis, uh, run it through our calculators just to prove that it's not going to be a problem. I don't think it'll be a problem, but we skipped a lot of the analysis because there's no point of running a tool with a zero in it. Um, they are required to meet the 595 standard, though. And so if they're not applying anything, that still means they have to do regular scouting. And so we're going to work with them on getting them like a notebook to write their scouting reports in because um, they still have to scout for that stuff and record that. Um, so it's not anything more than they're doing now. It's just put it on paper versus sticking it in your head. Um, a lot of our government projects are, um, we're paying people to be a better manager. And in reality, we think that means you just fill out paperwork. So three years later, you can remember what you did because you wrote it down. That's a lot of what uh, some of our management practices are. Um, Earlier, we were talking about some people in, in the Russell 2, the soil loss calculation. I do want to make it clear that we're talking that this program is down to the tolerable soil loss limit, which is typically in Iowa, a lot of our soils are five tons per acre per year. If you've had a compliance check, we're looking at two times that number. So you might pass the compliance check uh, when they come out and do it in the spring right after planting, but they're looking at a twice higher number than this program is. It's setting a, lower, a, a lot lower bar, a lot tougher bar to get through um, with that tolerable soil loss. Um, the payment rates, uh, you know, they're getting, like he said, over $200 an acre just for the 823 practice. Um, if uh, we don't have the, sign up, the uh, organic transition initiative in the future, which Kevin said we may not be doing that initiative anymore, it might just be part of our regular equip. Typically, our non-incentive programs don't pay quite as much. So I'm not sure what they're going to hand us in a few months for 2024 rates. It may not quite be as, in, as lucrative, but I think it's still going to be a pretty good rate. Um, uh, his dad, Aaron, made the comment to me that really sold it is, with rates like that, I can afford to transition a lot more acres versus waiting for a few more years, because they were really using one field a year and all of the organic ones are carrying the transition field, where they're farming transitionally. They're doing all those methods, but they're not making the premiums yet. And so it's a net loss a lot of times in those transition years. And so that's why we're doing this program. Um, we figured out as we went through this that the other practices that we associate with this, um, we can pay for. So since they weren't doing nutrient management, pest management yet, um, we're adding those to hit their contract, and they can get paid for those. If you're already doing it through another program, then you just have to keep maintaining it. Um, and so, um, you know, there's payments for the nutrient and the pest management. If you need to add a crop to your rotation, we can, a small grain, uh, to go from corn beans into your transition, we can help pay for the adding that extra crop in the rotation. Um, I've got one producer who's uh, organic, uh, some of it's transition, and they're corn beans and uh, relay planted rye. Uh, beans, the beans are relay planted into the rye. And so they've got a three crop rotation in two years. Um, and it's all organic. Uh, and I'm uh, sorry, it's all no-till. We're not doing any tillage in that system. And it's a struggle right now because of the weather. I think once we start getting rain again, I think it'll work a lot better for them. Um, but that's been interesting to see. Um, you know, we've got payments for ad, uh, prescribed grazing if you're going to do um, like fall stock grazing, that might be potential to put in um, into here. And then uh, there was mention about putting in like the prairie strips. Uh, I will tell you, EQIP will pay for conservation cover prairie strips, um, or we can do like a hayland planting if you want to continue to harvest those. But if you have crop history and you're willing to do CRP, it's going to give you an annual rent of 
you know, maybe two to three hundred dollars an acre. And so that might work out better for you to bring your field in CRP or put a prairie strip in in the middle with CRP than to just take our money to seed it down and then the payment stops for that. So it's something to consider. Typically when somebody asks me about a pollinator plot or a prairie strip, I start with prairie, CRP because it pays them 10 years of rent. Those are my notes that I wrote down. I forgot one thing, uh, and Clint probably knows this very well. Our latest soil test was 2018, and that's not gonna fly for this. So we will be updating that as well, but you know, yeah. just something we should have done anyway, I, I think. So. Yeah, so we use their existing soil tests to kind of run through and get the plan documented, but we won't be making a payment until another year from now. And so when we make that payment, we'll have to see those current soil tests and make sure all their calculations are based off of those. So there's, there's a version of the documents in there for obligation, but we're really not gonna make payments until we got everything dialed in just right. Great, thank you guys both for explaining it. Um, were there any more online, Roger, questions, statements? Or? Not a question, but a comment. Uh, I want to congratulate the USDA, USDA and RCS for a program that incentivizes less fossil fuel use, more perennials, and more grazing on the Iowa landscape. I see the A23 as a way to get more organic farmers on land in Iowa. Take that home with you, Kevin. <laughs> So yeah, we're, we're gonna conclude the main part of this. If anyone wants to stay and talk one-on-one -on -one with maybe Clint or Kevin and um, Ben, who have actually gone through this process, we encourage you to do that. I know looking at the forms didn't intimidate me as much as I thought it would, because um, Ben shared them with me through email and I, I read them all last night, so. They are doable. I'm sure it, a, lo a lot of it has to do with Clint helping them and who's the planner there too, the other guy, and Polk County. So, oh, James. James, yes. So that probably made the difference, but um, we hope everybody here has their eyes and ears and minds open more to applying for NRCS programs. Um, as Ben mentioned, it's our taxpayer dollars. We should take advantage of them. If those programs are out there, I would definitely consider um, visiting your local office and asking what programs can help you in transition and also for certified organic farmers. Did you have any final words, Kevin? Um, you know, I did have one quick question. Oh, for need a, we need a microphone. Hold up. Okay. Um, ben talked about you know, the difficulties you guys talked about it of no-till beans. And so I'm gonna ask you, if we had a program to where we go into a dry spring and let's say cereal rise 12 inches tall, it's May 10th. And we're saying it's, you guys, it's a dry spring. You wanna terminate that with tillage and then plant beans. I mean, how do you guys feel about that at that time of the year to make that decision? I mean, cereal rye is no fun to till, but it would be dry soils. That would work. Simply saying that for, for me, I think that that could work, yeah, because we have that flexibility built in all the time. We have to, sometimes we, drives my wife crazy. I change my mind 10 times a day sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of the stuff I read about it is that you should have a plan B and that, you know, there are certain time frames like that that you look at it and see if it's gonna be a viable option. And I don't know, it, but yet it's hard to really, I mean, generally we're not that dry up till May 10th and I don't know I shouldn't say that but it just seems like I've let it go when I probably this year I probably should have just said oh I, this is not going to work it's too dry this year but um you know it and then we got some rains just in time so I you know but now when you say whose decision is that to make when you said you would make it or we would make it no or, I think or, it you know it's I part think of our is you're saying if it's part of our 823 plan? Yeah, if we had we it set have... up for an option, 
and sometimes we're not as flexible as we need to be. But maybe we give half a payment when you terminate the cereal rye in May versus crimping it and no tilling into it. So that you can go into that and, and then you make the decision of which way to go and then we pay accordingly. I think that's a good, I mean, I think it shows flexibility and it's a good idea. Our, my question is, are you able to make partial pay? I mean, it seems like most of the time, most programs I've seen, you sign up for it and you get paid or else you don't get paid. I mean, are, are you saying this program allows for payments for certain portions of the of what you're doing? Um, no, we need to, and I say me and others would have to work with programs and national, and we got to make things a little more flexible so that we are able to get the products on the ground. Okay, so this is a what if yes. question. Sure, okay. I, I've got a question for you since we're just talking back and forth almost. Um, is, is this a whole farm program? It, it is, isn't it? I mean, you can't, I couldn't pick a, f a field and do this program on it. I, it. Would I have to do all the land that's, say, under my control? I feel like we should be texting or something. <laughs> um, no, I, there'd be no reason why we couldn't do a field or part of a tract really? okay. for this. Going to transition? Who's got a mic? Who's here over there? Sorry. Just to help the Zoom people. Um, for you, it's because for CSP, it's all the track, it's all the farms that you own and operate for CSP. For the for the 823, it's what farms that you know, this the OTI was for those that were transitioning. But typically for equip, it's just for general. It doesn't have to be all of your acres. It can be whatever acres you want to enroll as well. And one of the things we talk about flexibility, <clears throat> if we're starting to see drought conditions, dry conditions, you guys wanting to change, um, communicate with your field offices as soon as possible. And for field offices, as you're working with the producers, with organics, keep electronic files of all the documents you work with these folks on. Your Russell runs everything because then it's easier for us to make the changes to see if we still meet. And if we're not, we're gonna make phone calls and try to work with folks up at our state office to be able to try to do what we can from a contractual aspect, but also not get you into a financial disaster either. So communication is key on any of our contracts, whether it's organics or whether it's not. It doesn't matter. Because <clears throat> like I'm a grazing specialist um, and I live in Elkhorn, just not too far from him. We have been drier than snot. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I am gonna put a plug in for milk and honey and their support for local organics. It is amazing by the way, um, but Flexibility, we can work with you, but you need to communicate. And if we don't hear about it till after it's already done, it's gonna be harder for us to give you alternatives and options. So the sooner you know, the better and faster that we can try to get to it for you guys. Thank you very much. Yes, Thomas Manley from Marble Seed, which is a nonprofit that works with organic farmers, and he's been very active in the Wisconsin 823 document. So thanks for coming, Tom. Well, I'm happy to be here. And maybe a couple of things I'll just point out that, at least in Wisconsin, and if I'm reading your standard correctly here in, in Iowa too, everything there that we're talking about, those are additional criteria. There's, they're, they're not really impacted as part of the general criteria. Um, to the question of having to make changes in a given growing year based on conditions, the way we've been talking about this in Wisconsin and training on it is, I liken it to your, your organic systems plan. If you make a change in your organic systems plan, you're gonna wanna be communicating with your certifier. If you're making a change in your production system as, as part of this year 823 contract, you're gonna wanna be communicating with the folks in your NRCS office. There, and as we've seen with the, the example of the, the folks who are transitioning those acres now, they were, they were so far below T that in most cases, it's probably gonna take something pretty dramatic to get you above T if you're in a similar situation. 
but again, just to, to talk, to, talk to the folks you're working with in your local NRCS office, and chances are you're probably still likely going to be meeting the general criteria unless you're doing something really dramatic that's outside of the scope of the way you described your farming initially. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of concern. It seems about being able to meet the general criteria. There, these rock star farmers over here are meeting the general criteria and then some. And the reason the additional criteria exist is in an effort to constantly be pushing us toward better. That's, that's built right into organics from the very beginning. The idea of continual improvement, it is part of what we do in organic production. And this standard was designed to keep us all moving in that direction, whether we're, we're just transitioning or we've been a certified rock star farmer like these folks over here for, for decades. So um, I, there, the, there's a huge opportunity with this standard to, to ease that, that burden, both financial and that foregone income through the transition period. I, I'm a farmer who's benefited tremendously from, from the help of, of my NRCS folks that I've worked with on my farm. I wanted to bring that to the organic producers that I work with, so that's why I have the role I have with Wisconsin NRCS now. I'm embedded in Wisconsin NRCS in an effort to help roll out this standard and, and do some of the training around it and, um, and help NRCS speak organic because that's the kind of the missing piece. So um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here. I, I, this, was a, this was an awesome gathering. You, you couldn't have put a better bunch of farmers together to, to tell us about their experiences. And, uh, I just encourage everyone to, to talk to their NRCS agent. You got nothing to lose. Thanks so much, Tom. Other comments? Clint, you don't have anything else to say? Sure. Uh, I see. <laughs> I just want to point out that Steve Lewis, raise your hand. He is the other DC in the room that has been through this process, and he's got a contract too. So don't. Oh, who's that? Shane, um, well, there's, see, there's three of us, so you don't have to all pick on me after the meeting. There's three of us that have been through this and are trying to finalize these, um, so we've kind of fought through. A lot of the other offices are going to have a blank stare on their face when you come to them, which is the place I was at three months ago. So just accept that, that they're going to be like, uh, I don't know, I'm going to have to look into it. That's part of the game. They expect us to know a lot, and it's like drinking from a fire hose some days, so bear with us. Um, other than that, there was a mention of partial fields or, you know, um, the layman's, it's actually uh, half the field is already certified. So for the transition, we were doing just the other half um, that qualified. And so um, I could foresee you saying, okay, I'm going to just do the part that qualifies better and the steeper part, maybe it doesn't qualify and we're going to leave out. And, and maybe we would encourage you that look at if, if it's high for tillage or it's high for the P index, maybe we need to talk about a different rotation on those acres because we're trying to show you that that's not as sustainable as another part of your field. Thank you. So if anybody has any issues, call Clint, Shane, and Lewis. Lewis. Okay, thanks. We're glad we got the names now. I just have a question on how much training is required by the county NRCS people, or is it required, or? You're talking about organic? Yeah, for this program, so that they know what's going on and can help us. You know, we pretty much just encourage it, but when you're that field office, we know we have planners that have more experience with organic, so then we want those field offices that don't to go to their team, their four county unit, we want them to go to their area office, and then they want them to come to our state office. So we have different ways we're trying to support everybody. And we really appreciate Kevin organizing NRCS's participation here because I just approached him blind and said, it seems like there's a need. I'm hearing from some of the organic farmers that when they go into their local office, a lot of the NRCS guys don't know that much about A23. Do you think we can do a training? And this, that's why we're here today. So really grateful for all the NRCS people that came. Lewis has a question, comment? I think it's a comment. So. Um, one of the things, all the producers here and all examples, were the flat country. I mean, where meeting tea was, in the great scheme of things, fairly easy. I worked down in God's country for about eight, you know, 11 years, 
South Central Iowa, Wayne, Lucas, Clark, Decatur, God's Country. T is down there. There are some T's at two and three ton soils. And to get uh, organic operation down there sometimes took five, six, seven years of hay in the rotation to get. So the thing you got to be aware of and work with your office is can you make that transition to work and you may have to subdivide your fields and do management units. Um, my producer, um, he had three basic rotations he wanted to use. On one of his fields, we narrowed them down to two because he could not use that rotation on the whole field. He was going to have to subdivide that field if he wanted to do that to get it based on the primary soil type. So the key is work with your office and ask legit questions and plan because in this case, we were able to make a lot of these things work, but if you have a more marginal farm, more erosive farm, it's going to be a challenge to make the organic work there. Yes, and we, that's the first thing we say is definitely think about your slope. Um, there are certain places in Iowa that should not be farmed organically. And um, it's, it, I remember at one point there was a big discussion with NOP if we should require um, NRCS considerations in the organic rules. And I don't know why it was voted down, but um, I think majority of organic farmers do have that mentality that they want to practice soil conservation. Yes, tell them. with a lot of farmers in the driftless erosion is always a concern i think that this standard is an opportunity to encourage some of those producers on those slopes to move to grass-based systems and to stop tilling those those slopes altogether it, when when with the the general criteria that if you have ruminant animals you need a 528 that is a perfect opportunity to move those producers into a grazing system and help with the infrastructure to make that possible and I know that that's something we're focusing on in a lot of the areas of the driftless where it, it, it doesn't make sense to continue planting row crops. Thank you, Tom. All right, anything else online, Roger? Anybody else in the room? Any comments, questions? Once again, we really appreciate everybody coming and staying and such great questions and great discussion and um, we'll, officially end it now and then please stay around if you want to look at Ben's documents and um, scream. No, they're not that bad to fill out all these forms. Um, but thank you all and hopefully we'll get more A23 applications. Thank you.